Hey, what is going on, guys? Hope you're having a fantastic Saturday. It's not Sunday, so this is definitely different for us. We've got Easter tomorrow. A lot of folks we know will be celebrating that, so we wanted to not skip the podcast. We're doing it a day early, so I see some of you guys in the chat going, man, did I miss something? No, you didn't, man. That's what this is about. We're going to have some fun tonight, so glad you're here in the chat. Ryan, Rusty, what is happening, fellas? I'm going to let Rusty go. What's oh, going on, Rusty? Had a busy weekend. We uh, took the kids to Six Flags yesterday and nice. rode a bunch of rides. And so that was fun. Um, today, I, I went sun. on. Can you see the red? That's mm -hmm. not just the oh, light. Mm -mm. This is what you call a uh, Irish tan. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> um, I love it, dude. Then today... I did the real thrill ride is taking the car out on the track and you know there's no safety harnesses there so it's way more thrilling for me but what kind of car more time out in the sun do what what kind of car uh porsche gt4 gt4 nice great on the track no joke what's your top speed in it i man on this particular track i think 130 135 but it's it's That's lots of curves not really a not a straight line. It's not drag okay. racing. So it's not like an oval. It's more of a. Oh no! I think there's 13 mm -hmm. turns. Okay. And 3.1 miles, something like 3. that. Nice. Very exciting. A lot of fun. I mean, so it's thrilling because you're always afraid that you're gonna wreck or crash or yeah. die or something. So that keeps <laughs> it keeps it interesting. I'm just imagining you driving now and just whispering on your breath. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna oh yeah. Die. I'm hang gonna on, die. Hang on. I'm not dead, but I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. It's just more like <laughs> don't mess this up. Don't mess this up. That's funny, man. But it keeps you have it track insurance. No. Hmm. No, because I, I know live life thing, on the edge, on the bleeding too. edge. So do you have the option of purchasing that when you ride? Or? You you can, but it's, it's not really cheap. stinking expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And then is it do you have the track to yourself? Do you have a bunch of people on there? Is no, it just what I no, what I do is uh termed high performance driver's education. Okay. So you're not technically racing like for time or wheel to wheel. Um, <clears throat> but you're on the track with, I don't know, 20, 30 other cars and they are divided up in groups based off of experience level and speed. So mm -hmm. you're kind of running with people that are in your, your class. And I'm in the class. It's like just below instructor class. Mm -hmm. And the rules are though, that all passing has to be agreed on by both parties. So okay. you have to point them by and then, then they can pass. And so that way you don't end up in these like grind it out, try to run each other off the road. Sure. You know, it's, it's really safe. Nobody gets yeah. hurt. Rarely is there car damage. You're kind of learning to pass and that kind of stuff. Safety. Yeah, pass. it's just somebody gets on your bumper and then you give them the point by. And once uh -huh. you point them by, then you kind of let them by. If yeah. they're, if they're faster than you, you know, sure. you're supposed to let them by right away. Okay. That makes sense. Nice. Keeps it safe and a lot of fun. You, I mean, you, you go, there's no speed limit. You go as fast as you can go without running off the track. And sometimes <laughs> until you run off the track. Right. Man, that's sketchy. That'd be fun though, dude. Like I've always enjoyed going fast. I've never owned any kind of sports vehicle ever, but I've got some friends that have them and they'll take me for a ride in them. And it's crazy. I've been in um, a Ferrari, a McLaren, a R eight nice sorry yeah i think it's yeah. r8, uh -huh. Audi um, r8. what else um tesla plaid so all of those are fun dude i've so never done the uh i want to do the tesla plaid launch i've never done that but i've i've heard that it's really you it's know if you can do zero to 60 in two seconds yeah. that's awesome it's yeah it's it's pretty wild but super cool man ryan what about you man did some work on the Mad VR Experience Center. So that was. Yep. I saw the paint, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was covered. His whole yeah. face is all black. Let me see if I can get that picture. It's hilarious, man. He sends it to me. He said, I'm, I'm interested now. <laughs> yeah, I looked like. I looked like. <laughs> uh, hilarious. What's that movie? That I was an extra in Braveheart. 
is what it looks like. Let me find it. We're not gonna uh, have a scandal, are we? It was great. What's that? You so say we're not. Gonna, you're not gonna end up in a blackface scandal, are you? Nah. No, no, it's not on my computer yet, so I can't share it. Oh, okay. um, but I painted all day on Thursday, and it was two coats of primer. And then mm -hmm. did the whole thing in Duratex. So it was exhausting, yeah. but well worth it. And then you on Friday, hmm? paint your ceiling too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So then on Friday, they came in and they grinded the floors down. So it was great because it cleaned up all my mess. I didn't have to worry about <laughs> anything. They just grinded it all off. Nice. And then they, so they grinded all the extras down and then primed it and then put on a leveler, and then they come back on Monday and seal it. Mm -hmm. So it's like a matte black floor. Mm. So it's, and it's kind of got this, it's not like one shade. There's some like marbling or something going through it. There'll be a rug, so you won't really be able to see it, but I'm glad that's done. And now yeah. while that that's done, I'm going to schedule the uh, moves for the, subwoofers and get them moved down and then i'll start running electrical and moving stuff in so we're we're getting there it's that is. just so another what, check you, off the box sure did you locate some suckers or movers uh, you, safe movers that oh so you found somebody that would do it yeah i did cool. yeah i mean you just tell them hey it's about it's the size of a large safe mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i mean there's big gun safes, so they know how to move that stuff. Yeah, it's not like yeah. they're unaccustomed to it. Um, they were worried about like the stairs and stuff, mm -hmm. not the width of the stairs, but the integrity of the stairs. So they're like, yeah. send us pictures of the underside of your stairs. We can make yeah. sure that everything's going to be okay. But it was, it was fine. Uh, Nicholas says the smell of Duratex for the first time when I opened my RS2 boxes. I didn't have much of a smell because I got these. This fan and ducting from AC Infinity, like I was, we talked about last week, mm -hmm. like I was doing a grow farm, and it took kind of all of that it out. out. It took it all out, and I nice. piped it out of a window. So really that was cool. awesome. That worked yeah. really well. And then the guys that were doing the floor used it again because it was helped them mm -hmm. not sit there in the dust. Uh, so that's that was my that weekend. Helped even with the overspray going out into your room too. That adjacent yeah. room. Yeah, so, nice. because it was creating a negative pressure, so it was pulling mm -hmm. things out, and then it was sucking air in. So I did have it draped off, mm -hmm. but I didn't have any overspray That's come cool. out. Um, so that was the end of my week, and then today was I cleaned out my garage. So that Productive was week, that man. needed to happen, and then tomorrow mm -hmm. is Easter, but I'm going to do some yard work because mm -hmm. I got to cut some shrubs back and make the yard look nice. Nice. That's it. What about you, Michael? Kept the, grand, kept the grandbaby for a couple of days. My son yep. and daughter-in-law, they went over to Orlando and spent two days. So we kept him Thursday night, all day Friday, and they picked him up Saturday afternoon uh, today. Um, got a couple of cool things in for review. I'm excited about that. Um, got the Arundel 1723 THX, the smaller version, the S version. Um, and they're in white satin. So I'm excited about it. I don't know what it is, but ever since Martin Logan sent me the F200s in white, mm -hmm. I've been fascinated with white speakers, man, for some mm -hmm. reason. So I'm curious to see what these are going to look like. Um, they also sent me the the taller towers, the big THX in white satin. So I'll do some videos, even just kind of comparing like size-wise, what do these look like next to each other? Um, of course, we'll talk about the sound. Um, but then I also, this was really cool. I got a package from um, Outlaw Audio, actually two packages. So they have uh, been recommended like countless times here on the channel. A lot of guys say, hey, man, have you ever reviewed any of their stuff? And I reached out to them a long time ago and just never heard back from them. So I just kind of moved on, didn't, figured they weren't interested. And recently, I don't know, they somehow heard that I reached out and, and didn't get in touch with them. Maybe I made a comment or in a Facebook group or something word got back to them. And so they reached out to me and they said, Hey, Michael, we hear you reached out to us in the past and didn't hear back from us. So we're, we're sorry about that, but we'd love to send you some stuff. And so we talked about it, figured out what would work well. And, um, so I'm gonna start off with like a two channel, uh, I'm sorry, two mono blocks. Um, so I'll use those for the, uh, the R and review. That'd be really cool as well as, 
I want to hear them on the two channel setup in my living room with the F 200 from, um, uh, and I'm drawing a blank Martin Logan's. So it'd be fun. That'd be my first experience with monoblocks too. So I'm, I'm curious about that. You're going to put them on the F 200s. Yeah. Heck yeah. Interesting. Yeah. They're three, 300 Watts per channel continuous into four ohms, 200 Watts continuous. And that's what I've got now. I've got a 200 watt by two Acuras amp. Um, but it, it's just a really, really old amp. It doesn't have trigger outs. Um, so these new ones have trigger outs. They've got, um, they're pretty slim too. They're only three inches tall. So are they class um, D? I had looked on their website. Um, I think they're class AB. They've got a big Toroto transformer, but it doesn't really say anywhere on their documentation if it's if it's that. I looked online and what's the model? 2220. Oh, I see him. Mm -hmm. Um, the 20 or the I think it was the 2200. I found like some reviews from a long time ago. That was a previous model. And I thought some people were saying that that was a class G amplifier. Um, so I'm, I'm not real sure to be honest with you. I probably just need to email them and just ask them, but, but I think they're class AB, but, but everybody says they don't get like hot. So, um, I, won't I feel like these are class D. I don't know though. Why would they have a Toroto transformer? Hmm. Can you, have how much do they weigh? Uh, 17 pounds. So oh. they're not like super light. They're like a typical class D, class D. Yeah. Like I said, it's got a big old beefy transformer. I've seen some pictures of, I think it was a 2200 with the top off. That's got a, you know, it's probably about that big around. So it's a big old boy. So, but yeah. So, but that was pretty much my weekend. And so I'll be doing some videos this week. I'll get the Arndall's unbox. I'll get the, um, Outlaw Audio Unbox and start making some fun videos on that. So, so tonight we'll be answering you guys' questions. So if you got questions, drop those in the chat. Of course, Super Chats get priority, but they're not required. And also want to give a huge thanks to our podcast sponsor, Ascend AV, man. So we're excited to have Ryan and Ascend AV, a sponsor of the podcast. And so if you guys need any kind of upgrade, man, if it's a subwoofer, if it's speakers, projector screens whatever hit ryan up uh, you can visit his website at ascendav.net so super appreciative for Ascend it was about AV. time that i made something happen <laughs> it needed to happen we're excited man so cool man so let's jump into it if you guys got questions drop those in the chat we're gonna have some fun tonight while you're doing that let me go ahead and say hi to some folks we got k man he was very first one on here, man. Good to see you at Kev's Home Cinema. Brian, Michael, good to see you. I know Michael, He's he's got a couple of the, um, he'll be at some of the home theater experiences at M-Wave. So no, he's excited about that. I've talked to him. Scott, good to see you. Tyler, Tyler's going to be there. He's from Canada. He's one of my patrons. Scott's one of my patrons. I see a lot of my patrons in here. Appreciate you guys. Van, good to see you. Bruce, got Robert, lots of folks in the chat, man. Glad you guys can make it. I know this is not our normal day, um, but because of Easter, we um, <laughs> just read some comments. Uh, because of Easter, we're doing this a day early. I'm looking at this one. Oh, that's funny. So Mark says, if Michael does his reviews in the evening, will it be nights in white satin? Who knows, man? Let's see. I'm with you, Michael. I'm really digging the white satin look. There, That's nice. Uh, something about it is just super clean. Mm -hmm. The only other speaker I ever reviewed that was white was the Canto Tux. Mm -hmm. They didn't have an amazing finish, you know, but they were white. And and that was the first time I'd ever seen any, but I've never reviewed like any towers that were uh, white satin. So now what I'm wondering though, because they're satin, I want to see if like you can see fingerprints because with the black, I think I reviewed the black satin when you put your fingers on it. I mean, it you definitely mm. want to be handling it with gloves or a towel or something like that, or just white satin is usually not as bad. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I hope so. So yeah, so I I'll had, be posting that. I had a matte black Harley and it was a fingerprint magnet. Mm. It didn't matter. You could like 
mm-hmm. think about a fig- fingerprint and one would appear. It, it was sure. awful. And then you had to be really careful when you cleaned it because if mm-hmm. you push too hard, it would, well, I don't know what the word for it, was like glossify the matte finish. Kind of and then you it. Were, yeah. And you were just in deep trouble. So yeah. <clears throat> Matt's white speakers, I think you'd be okay. Mm-hmm. Just be careful when you clean them. Heinel Ammon, we will get to your question. I've seen, I think you've posted like six times. We will yeah. get there. I promise. Yep. I got it started. Yep. Oh, you know what? I think I probably started after you start another one. It's okay. I unstarred yours. Okay. I, I see what you did. Yep. So we'll do these in order, guys. So just keep them coming and uh, we'll just go ahead and jump right in. We hit them back up to the top. Is uncertain. Heinzelberg says, is there any disadvantage of mounting in wall type speakers with a back box on wall? Interesting. Don't do it. I think the one thing that's going to be weird is it's going to look weird because typically you've got a little lip on the front and then it kind of, you know, there's an indention and then there's the back box. So I don't know if it's, would that affect the sound at yes. all? I would not do that because a speaker that is designed to be in wall should be put in a wall. Mm. Um, You're going to mess with the spur or the SBIR or how it interacts with the boundary. Um, So having the speaker out front or away from the wall is Mm. going to cause unwanted variation from how the speaker was intended to be utilized Mm -hmm. so and then you have to consider like was this speaker meant to have a backer box on it is supposed to be utilized in the cavity inside of the wall Mm -hmm. you really want to use speakers in a way that they were designed to do so something that we actually run into at Mm m-wave is when you have to deal with on walls like take a sendo as an example you really need to put them on a wall or next to a wall right like right up against it so yeah. we have to that's something that we have to consider and that we are working with ascendo and their partners to be able to make happen um, so if you're going to buy something i would encourage you to buy something for its intended purpose now if you have it now and you have to compromise compromise i get it i mean we all compromise in some capacities just realize that it's not going to be ideal mm-hmm yeah, and I remember now thinking back when I interviewed and, and did um, Matthew Pose's home theater tour. So Matthew was talking a lot about the Perlissons that he runs and and just the benefits of having an in-wall because of what Ryan saw. about. It doesn't have some of the interaction with the room because it's on literally on a baffle wall. And so um, that makes sense. Pulling that out of way, now you're causing some interaction even behind that speaker. Because he was even telling me uh, when he came over to my house, because I told him I'd eventually I want to do like a baffle wall, pretty much seal up inside my cabinet behind the screen just to prevent any kind of reflections. And he was sharing with me how sound, you know, of course, you've got sound that comes out of the front of the speaker, but sound also radiates around to the back of that speaker. And then that sound mm-hmm. interacts with your front wall. Well, so and even if it's an on or in wall, you're still <laughs> going to have interaction with the boundary, but it's designed for that interaction. Sure. So you just need yeah. to buy something and then as much as possible, utilize it It's in its an intended purpose, in an, mm-hmm. its intended way, is how yeah. I should say. And somebody asked if this is a Corona. No, it's not a Corona. Celsius. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Much a bad better influence. Tasting. Bad influence on you, man. Yeah, but it's all good. Since like, I started, and I know it's probably man. not related to this, I've actually lost weight. Yeah. So yeah, there's no cal or is it 10 calories? No, it's cal- not because of the calories. I feel like for the caffeine and stuff, I just don't eat as much. Like, well, yeah. this has zero calories too. That was a Coke I, Zero Sugar. I thought they would help me lose weight. Yeah. I got off Coke, but and tea. No, I think it's just the amount of caffeine. <laughs> it I just don't eat as much. Hmm. Maybe it's not related. I don't know. But All right. I'll say it is. Get that Celsius sponsorship, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Gotta have one of those Celsius fridges back here. <laughs> it's just... awesome, man. <laughs> Maybe yeah, an LED just, hat. <laughs> just Jessica now buys them by the case for me. So on Amazon, she'll mm-hmm. Amazon's like 12... the place to get them. Mm-hmm. My favorite is like you like the orange, I think. I like the tropical, I think it's like tropical passion or tropical something. So oh. 
Orange never... and uh, grape cherry or apple or mm -hmm. something. It tastes like okay. a apple jelly rancher. <laughs> I've never had a Celsius. Are these just like the flavored sparkling waters or something else? It's, it's marketed as an energy drink, but I, man, I'm telling you, I don't, it doesn't change anything in my body. It doesn't change my heart rate. doesn't change my focus. It, it, it has 200 milligrams of caffeine. It's just an alternate to Coke or tea or, you know, something that has a lot of sugar in it. Evidently, Michael has this <clears throat> heavy. I don't I don't even know the word, but he's his body's used to caffeine. Maybe. Okay. I mean, I'm, so 200 milligrams is actually a lot. A bit. That's a lot. Because Soda has 36. Coke is yeah. 34 36. milligrams. Yeah. 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 But I'm drinking caffeine free Coke Zero. Oh, still out the trash. Got nothing. Ugh. But I'm drinking water today, so we're good. All right. So Heinlow Amen says Clips Cornwall fours versus JTR two twelve HT. Better value? Question mark. Also, clips are more efficient, so no need for a high power amplifier. Actually, both of those are super efficient. What is um, the Cornwall? I don't know what the Cornwalls. Typically, the Heritage speakers are very efficient. Clips Cornwall four. Well, what? How was was your experience with the Cornwalls? So I've only heard Cornwalls in somebody else's home. I've owned a ton of Clips speakers. I've owned the Heresies. I've owned Forte twos. I've owned. Um, I mean. I've owned over 50 pair of clip speakers over the years. The Cornwalls, they're, I think they've got a 15 inch in the front. They might even have a passive radiator in the back, I believe, like a 12. Um, they're a great sounding speaker. They have way more bottom end than the La Scala's do that I had. I had three La Scala's up front. Mid range on them are great. They're just a phenomenal speaker. Um, I'm looking on their website. I want to see. I feel like the Noesis is actually more efficient than the. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's so, one. I mean, the 212 is actually very efficient, much more efficient than the Klipsch. The Klipsch, I would bet, are not as efficient <laughs> as they state they are, but I have confidence that Jeff's numbers are real. All right, let's see. So the Cornwall 4s have an efficiency of 98. I already looked. Well, why don't you state that at the beginning? I'm showing 102. I'm looking at the manual on Klipsch's website. Me too. And it says 98.5. I'm looking at the spec sheet from 2019. Well, maybe this is older. But it doesn't say, like this one doesn't specifically say Cornwall 4. On oh, the, the website it does, but when you click on the product spec sheet, no, it does say Cornwall 4. Yep. So yeah, 102. So showing, they're showing one, 102 sensitivity. I would bet they're not 102, though. And a lot of people say that. You know, they. I don't have the ability to measure them. A lot of people say they're probably 3 to 5 dB different. Um, so, yeah. So, they're both going to, either way, they're both going to be super efficient and they don't take a whole lot of power to to get those speakers cranking. Um, as far as better value, honestly, I don't know what, like even how much the Cornwalls. I always owned a lot of the older clips, so I had like Forte twos that I spent two hundred fifty bucks on or three hundred bucks on um, the Heresy. Her the Heresy, I think they were Heresy threes, either Heresy three or Heresy fours. And I spent two hundred fifty bucks on those. Um, crazy deal. So I've always owned a lot of their older stuff. My La Scala's were 40 years old. They're made in 1980. Um, had those for quite a few years. Um, so I don't even know what the, the current price is on, on them. Um, but honestly, both great speakers, different profiles, of course. The um, 212 HTs, they're going to have a, a coaxial driver in the center. The JTR is going to spank the Klipsch and then Hi so, Hennel says the Klipsch is eight ohms and the JTRs are four. Any yeah. amplifier that's 
decent isn't going to have a problem with either of these. When yeah. you're dealing with an efficiency of 101 or 102 dB, I mean, it's just going to take you a few watts to get to mm -hmm. reference volume. So yeah. I really would not worry about that unless you're chasing very, very high volumes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the corn walls are going to have more bottom in than the two twelves, um, but I think Ryan. So I got a question for you on more bottom JTR. In. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, there's not a lot of low end. Go look at the um, the two twelves. Uh, JTR two twelve. Oh, okay. Eight, there's eight. sixty hertz. Yeah, so they're they're pretty high. Um, the corn walls measure down to thirty four. So I'm talking I about the 212 RTs, though. What's that? Are we the talking about the HDs? Oh, HD. HD. Mm -hmm. I so the corn wall is not really extending down to 34 hertz at a flat frequency response, though. There's no way. I don't know. Like I said, it's got a 15 inch and a 12. 15 inch in the front. It doesn't. It just has a 15. It doesn't have anything in the back. It's just a 15 and the horn and the... Man, for some reason I thought they had... It was like a, a dual. They had a, a passive radiator on the back. Maybe that was the older Cornwalls I'm thinking of. Like, I'm hmm. sure it's great for two channels. Yeah. I think these speakers are actually decent in the Clips lineup, but... Oh, for sure. As far as value, yeah. JTR. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, I, I mean, Dan says, I heard the Cornwall 4s today... Uh, so fun. They're a great speaker. Yeah, I don't um, think they're bad. I've seen guys, like, if you guys have an opportunity to come to M-Wave, one of the guys that um, Stephen do, you may know him from the Clips community, he's got a ton of clip speakers. He's got his whole home theater with Clips Heritage up front. I think he has three Cornwalls up front. So they definitely can. Okay, appreciate that, Justin. Justin said the por the Fortes were the ones that have the, the passive radiators in the back. So... Why are the JTRs rated at 2.0 volts? Normally, they're always rated at 2.83. That's what I, I tend to see more often. And does that change the sensitivity? Are yeah. we comparing apples to apples? No. Yeah, I, don't know. I don't know what that is. I've always, you know, it's the your, ones that I've seen is the like output one volt, at one meter. It's the output voltage from the AVR mm -hmm. or the pre. Yeah, so like one's rated at 2.83 and the other's rated mm -hmm. at 2.0. I'm wondering if we're comparing apples to apples. Right, I see what you're saying. You can look at, uh, I feel like Aaron's Audio Corner has done a review on these. Okay. I don't know what he got them at. Mm -hmm. I don't know why Jeff does it at two. Yeah, and I see what you're saying. I don't know what that normal, a lot of times you'll see it it's 2.83 uh, one one watt mm -hmm. at one meter yeah it's 2.83 volts one watt at one okay. meter is usually what you see but there's different brands i mean mm -hmm. if you look hard enough you'll notice that they're not all 2.83 yeah. some of them don't rate from 20 to 20 you know 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz so yeah there, there's i wish there were more um what's the word standards yeah across the board so smig appreciate the five dollar super chat he says my home theater is more enjoyable than the dolby atmos commercial theater that's exactly why we build them my man congrats on that how much better are high-end home theaters great question i think a lot of home theaters can exceed what you would experience at a commercial cinema um, especially if it's not like a dolby cinema or a adobe atmos i'm sorry an imax um, cinema, like my local cinema here is pretty doo doo. It's not very good at all. Um, but I have to travel probably about 30 minutes to go to IMAX and Dolby Cinema. But even those are quite different. Um, IMAX doesn't have as much bottom end, it's really loud and like in your face, but you don't get that tactile response. The Dolby Cinema is sounds really good, you get the tactile response. But I'm wondering just how much of that is the kind of like the butt kickers or the butt, you know, tactile transducers in the seats that add to that. But, um, man, I've, I've experienced some budget home theaters that are phenomenal. 
I've experienced some really, really high end home theaters that are phenomenal. How much better is a high end home theater? I mean, that's going to be subjective. Um, sometimes, you know, let's just say, for instance, like you may not like the sound of wisdom audio and that's considered high end. I mean, they're $20,000 per speaker. Some of their models, um, you may not like the sound of a JBL synthesis. Those are decently expensive. You may not like the sound of per listen. So high end, I think is, I don't think the price is what dictates how it's going to sound. It's design implementation, room acoustics, calibration, all of that can play a huge role, um, more so than just how much they spend on the gear and the, you know, how much they spend on the speakers and such. What do you guys think? Well, I think going from a commercial sentiment to home theater is a massive jump. And then, I mean, you definitely get a return on investment um, to a point, but then there's a pretty sharp diminishing return too. Um, but, you know, I think, I think you get a, a pretty good, I don't know where the dollar amount is at some point you're just paying for more seats. And, and mm -hmm. so if you don't need more seats then you're paying for something you're not really using, mm -hmm. but I haven't been to a commercial theater. I, uh, last one, I went and saw Oppenheimer in the IMAX, the full resolution film. Cause I was you know, in Dallas. There's one, uh, is sure. a theater that was one of the, you know, 20 or so. I can't remember the exact number that was showing it. And that was cool because that was, uh, it was <clears> different. <throat> but for the most part, I don't like theaters because I don't like the public, the people. <laughs> They're not very <laughs> considerate most of the time. Sometimes it can be a good experience. Um, I've only been a couple of times where actually thinking back when I went to my local one here in Plant City, we just, I almost got an altercation with three young boys. Um, they were just super, I was very kind. They came in literally the last maybe five to 10 minutes of the movie. And they sat probably about five seats over from me. And they just started talking like literally out loud. It wasn't a whisper. They were just being very known, you know. Um, one guy had his phone on. Brightness was up completely and so the whole time i'm trying to watch the ending the conclusion of this movie and all i can see is you know this distraction over to my mm -hmm. left so i just leaned over real nice i'm like hey fellas if you guys don't mind you know just put away your phone the movie's almost done and i forgot exactly what he said but he just basically got real rude to me and i'm like dude can you just tell your friend to put his phone up till the end of the movie that's all i'm asking and so he refused. So I went out and talked to the manager. Well, they followed me out. I said, let's go. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not going to throw down, but it was like, what's the deal here, fellas? So, and then they got real rude in front of the management. And I'm just like, man, so, what's wrong with this generation? Come yeah, on. What? It was just kindness, man. Just be I don't kind. think that has anything to do with a specific generation. What's that? <laughs> I don't know if it is or isn't, but. Those kids. Yeah. And like I said, it was, and it's, it's not all kids. I mean, I raised my son and my daughters, they have respect. They have manners. They say yes, ma'am. And no, ma'am. And, you know, but not everybody raises their kids that way. And so I think a lot of it goes back to that is how you were raised. And, um, and plus, you know, they're just typical, not typical kids, but they are kids, you know, so they're probably in high school and, well, yeah, I was, uh, when, needless I, to say, they were, they were, I went back in the theater. They stayed out when we came out, they were kind of sitting by the, the video games. And then when me and my wife walked out, I mean, they definitely were like staring us down the whole time. So I just kind of kept my head on the swivel, you know, just to see if they were going to follow me out, but they didn't fortunately. So I think a lot of it is subjective as far as the, the, person's question i mean sure what you value and what you think is worth it or not worth it that's totally up to you mm -hmm. um and he, part of his question was how much better are 
high-end home theaters. Some over... people would probably say that they're not. Some people mm -hmm. will say that they are. It's a yeah. subjective answer. Nobody's There's no consistency to the answers that you are going to get. Yeah. Um, a big part of that, I think, is because a lot of the theaters aren't run the same way. Mm -hmm. Like you have people that'll misconfigure things, things aren't set up correctly, and that comes back to the experience. I think if a theater is set up correctly, mm -hmm. it can be really good, but a lot of times it isn't. So mm -hmm. subjective. So you guys don't have much in Olathe? Mm, no, we do. Uh, as far as the experience, I don't know. The theaters are capable. We have IMAX, mm -hmm. Dolby Cinemas. Okay. Um, we have all kinds of different stuff. Yeah, it's, man, Ryan Ryan lives in Olathe. Yeah, I, I think it's... Mm. I don't know. I'm not a very good one to answer that question because I haven't been to a commercial theater in several years. So maybe they're not very good anymore. They used mm. to be fine. But I don't like my experience being up to other people. Yeah, I want to be the one that's at fault. Sure. Scroll back up here. All right. So, Michael, how is the AVM 70 going with no mini DSP? Honestly, I'm struggling with it. Um, so I still have to do some tweaking. I don't have the tactile response that I have with the Marantz AV7706. So I don't know what that is. I've talked to some friends that that have that. Um, pretty much all of them tell me you got to crank. Uh, I forget what it is, but it's one of the settings. They said max that thing out because um, it's not going to, to add as much bass as, as you're going to like. So I've got that maxed out at like five or six, whatever that number is. Um, but I still need to get back into it and play with it and see if there's anything, take some measurements. Um, last time I tried to measure some speakers, man, I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't know if it's my Mac or if it's the, it's not the microphone because I tried it with a U-Mic 1 and a U-Mic 2, got the same results. I measured a speaker and the top end just literally dropped off, like at 10,000 hertz. I mean, it was like a plummet to the ground. I don't know, that's weird. And so I thought maybe the speaker was defective. So I got a totally different brand, totally different speaker. Same exact thing. All right. Well, this is, is this with part. arc. No, this was like, yeah, I had nothing to do with it. I'm just saying I need to take some measurements, but I need to find out if it's even measuring correctly. So I don't know what was going on with that. Um, it could be your test tone. Could be, I don't know. That was with the seven, but I've never seen that before ever. And I've had the 7706 for, gosh, four years now, something like that. So, but yeah, so I mean, I, I like it. Um, there's some features I like on the 70. Um, but like I said, I, I'm not going to give it a, um, I want to give it its, some time, see if I can figure this thing out before I do my review on it. But it's a great unit, not as stable as, as the Marantz. Um, uh, with the Anthem MCA 525 Gen 2 run JTR 212 RTs and 212 HTRs to reference and beyond at three meters. What is the MCA 525? 525 Gen 2. So $3,800 five channel amplifier. And that is 225 watts into 8 ohms, 400 watts per channel of 4 ohms. Yeah, you're not going to have any issue running that joker. I mean, 400 watts going into the JTRs, and they're already stupid efficient. Yeah, you'll easily be able to hit reference with that. What do you think, guys? I'm looking at the spec sheet right now. So Anthem is showing. Here, I'll pull it up. <clears throat> yeah, so we're looking at 400 watts because they're four ohm speakers. But is that regardless of the number of speakers being driven? Mm, oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, this says with all channels driven at least yeah. with 225 and 8 ohms. So you would wouldn't expect. have a problem with that. Yeah. Typically, with your external amplifiers, you're going to be all channels driven. Not. I mean, the Marantz yeah. isn't. I've never had a Marantz. 
Their Rants new one is in amplifiers, do they? Yeah, they do. Do they? I've never yep. had a Marantz amplifier. Yep. Okay. So it just depends. It's important it's to check. You just want to make sure that regardless of the manufacturer, that the wattage that it's outputting is all channels driven because that can be marketing play that companies will use to make things be more, have a better spec, I get mm -hmm. listing than what it may actually do with all channels driven. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing though that I'm seeing, and maybe this isn't, is this the right picture? Because I'm on Anthem's website, MCA525 Gen 2 Specs, okay. and it shows a two-channel amplifier. Mm, this one's showing a five-channel on Crutchfield. Anthem, MCA525, Anthem AV, power amplifier, Gen 2, 3700. Yeah, it's a five channel amplifier, 225. Why do they show a two channel on their spec? On which part? On the Anthem website, looking at the 525's Gen 2's spec sheet, it shows a two channel amplifier. Oh, that I don't know. Hmm. Like you got like a PDF or something? No, oh, it's on their website. Say. Yeah. He's Just right. under the specs tab? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you click on specs at the bottom. Oh, the I see the photo. Oh, yeah. It show that's the MCA 225. Never mind. But it show like when you click on it. No, it's saying 525. Gen I know, two, but it right? shows a picture of a 225. It's really yeah, weird. Right. The, the that's what I'm saying. Down they, below. they just have it wrong there. Contact the webmaster. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's a boo-boo. Yeah, so that's not the correct. Uh, yeah, down here you says this is 225 on the model number. The specs are correct, but the uh, good eye are wrong. there, Ryan. Hmm? That's a good eye there. I got to be useful in some capacity. Uh, you do quite well. Sometimes. So the long answer, the short answer to that long answer is that yes, it would have no problem. Yeah. Easily drive it. Dirty Motif, so, appreciate the $5. What's that? I was going to say, I did a ran a quick calculation to get for that speaker to get um, 104 dB at 13 feet would only require 64 watts. Yeah. Now and that that's, doesn't, with, that's not with EQ, though. So I know, but just basic, simple math. Dirty Motif, appreciate the $5 super chat. He says, Youth Man, thanks for the support in your comments. Appreciate it, man. So I'm assuming maybe you asked a question on a video. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And I replied to you. I do my best to reply. When Rusty and I were talking about this behind or backstage before the show tonight. And he said, man, I don't know how you do it. I mean, you get DMs, you get Facebook messages, you get comments, you get emails. And I get all those all day long. And I physically can't like provide. I mean, I've got one guy. He asked, he needed some help on how to hook up his receiver to his um, his TV. So I responded, you know, real quick, boom, easy, move on. Well, of course, he's got another question, follow-up question. So then I go a little bit lengthier, and I'm thinking, okay, if he comes back in, a third time, I'm basically going to say, you know, unfortunately, I can't provide, like, one-on-one -on -one support. You're going to have to do some research. But fortunately, he was like, all right, appreciate it, man. Thanks for the help. That must have answered his question. So I do the best that I can, but as the channel continues to grow, it it definitely makes it harder to reply to everybody. So a lot of times you may just get a thumbs up or a heart and that just lets you know, I did read your comment, but I didn't re respond to it. Um, here's another tip to <laughs> the longer your text is or comment, m the more likely I probably will not respond to it because usually it's, Hey, youth man, I love your channel. Got a question, but then there's seven questions in there and it's like, I, there's no way I can physically you know, be able to, to answer all those and it's, it'll never be short. So, um, but yeah, appreciate it, man. Do the best I can. Spillage Village, appreciate the $10 super chat. I'm looking at refreshing all my speakers from Gen 1 Clips and a 7.2.2. Okay, so he's got a 6K budget roughly. Uh, looking at the Thevas, all right, so that is Focal. 
uh, with two app. Oh, I'm sorry. What does he mean there? Looking at the Thevas with two Atmos from Focal. So are you looking to switch to Focal? That's what my, that's how I understood that. So when you say refreshing all, okay. So my thought originally he's got gen one and by refreshing, I thought he meant go to a, a newer clips, but maybe he's talking about just going a different direction. Um, it sounds to me like he's talking about going to Focal. Mm -hmm. Um, Clips are kind of bright on the forward end, but Focals are too. So the good thing is I think they're going to have somewhat of a similar um, sound signature. Uh, they're definitely not like really laid back, the ones that the Focals that I've heard. The Thevas, was that the one that we had last year? That Those were the Vestias. Okay. I don't. I haven't heard the Thevas yet, so I don't know how they... Have you heard those? Either I don't one even one? know what they are. Pull it up. Um, Focal Thevas. Okay. I'm wanting Focal to say Thiev yeah, Focal is Thevas. Yeah, I think they're a series above the Vestia, or is that their entry level? No idea. Let me know in the chat if you guys know because I'm not familiar with their lineup because Focal's got a pretty extensive lineup. I mean, they go from super budget friendly to like hundred thousand dollars or more. Uh, when you get up to the Utopia uh, brand or to the Utopia um, uh, let's see yeah honestly I, I just don't know enough about those and I haven't heard those particular speakers um, what makes you want the Thevas no, I, the I think the Thevas are higher than the area and the Vestia and then the next series would be the core is above that. I want to know why he's thinking about those speakers. Yeah, you just are you want to try something new? Is there something you feel like you're lacking? Also, what clip speakers do you have? Um, you know, if you're going from Clips's budget, you know, Best Buy kind of speaker, the reference series that they sell at Best Buy, that's probably going to be a huge difference with the Thevas. If you're going from you know, their RF 73s or even their, um, uh, what, what am I thinking of? The reference premiere might not be as big of a, a change. So, but again, I haven't heard the Thevas, so I don't know. It'd be hard for me to offer any really advice on that. What's that? Let me look at these. Which Thiva are you looking at? Because I'm, <laughs> like how, do said, they, how do they fit into your $6,000 budget? Don't know. Especially if you do towers, they're going to eat up half of your budget. Mm -hmm. And then the bookshelves are a thousand each. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Cause he's talking nine speakers from them. Mm -hmm. So how would, how would that work? Yeah, let us know. Give us some more context. We'll come back to you. And why Thiva? Okay. Fair enough. Hey, I got a question for y'all. It kind of ties yeah. into that. Yeah, I'm curious what you think. I'll come back to you, Holly. If, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't oh, realize. Okay. Cool. Um, so in his example, would you recommend him to say if he had a fixed budget, would he be better off? to do say a five channel system of speakers that cost $1,200 a piece versus a nine channel system mm. of, you know, whatever Less that ends up to $700 a piece. W what would you think? I think mean, it depends on what speakers he's looking at, because again, we, we know that, just because you spend more on speakers doesn't necessarily mean you get better performance or better sound quality. Um, you might get a better cabinet. You might mm -hmm. get um, more craftsmanship and things like that. So again, I think part of that's going to be, what are they comparing it to? But yeah, if I'd rather have a smaller channel count, better performance than more channel count with lesser performance. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's what I would mm -hmm. think if I, like if I, if I was working on a budget, mm -hmm. I think, well, cause I hear Ryan say this a lot you say you buy the best subwoofer you can afford. And then when you can afford a second one, buy the second one. And mm -hmm. I, I think that that's kind of a good, it makes sense to me. You apply the same thing to speakers. Now you got to probably buy them in pairs or start with three and then mm -hmm. add on two more and two more until you get to the, your end game. The reason okay. for that is a lot of times you're going to run into just incremental upgrades and just moving mm -hmm. a little bit up. Yeah. And then a little bit up. And if you're redoing the entire system every time, it gets expensive. It's a lot of lost capital, right? You're mm -hmm. investing a lot into the system and it's just going away. So yeah. especially if you're buying retail and selling for 50% off. My opinion, it's get the best you think you would want. Start with two channels. Start with one sub and then add over time. Make that the journey instead of upgrading incrementally every every x amount of time mm -hmm. i think that's that's a way to get to a much more sound conclusion and end where you're going to be much more satisfied mm -hmm. than constantly chasing incremental increases in performance or what you mm -hmm. think are going to be incremental increases in performance because if you just start doing these incremental jumps a lot of times there is no benefit Right. You're not getting into anything that the previous thing that you had couldn't do. Mm -hmm. So why change? Make it worthwhile. Right. If you're looking just for something different with that looks different, make a grill. I don't know. Somebody on Etsy or something can probably make you a custom grill so that it looks different. It's probably a lot cheaper yeah. than buying new speakers. Mm -hmm. So I always think you buy the best that you can do. And then build from there. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think there's a certain like buyer satisfaction. I hear a lot. It's like, well, I went from, you know, AVR to separates and it wasn't that much better. And you feel like you kind of, your money wasn't well spent. So I, you know, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, Ryan. It's like, if you're going to do an upgrade, like make it a substantial enough upgrade that you feel like you got something out of it. Not mm -hmm. like this, you know, 5% increase. Cause mm -hmm. you you know, you kind of, you spend all the money and you don't feel that good about it, you know? Have that buyer's remorse. Mm -hmm. And you will have it. There is always going to be a case of FOMO. Every time. And sometimes right? you just got to resist that, you know? You do. You absolutely do. But, but my, recommend, my recommendation is to try and do things to not encounter that, right? Even if it's buying things on the used market or starting with one or two speakers and then going mm -hmm. from there. I mean, you're yeah. going to get a much more satisfied end than doing these incremental jumps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brad says Focal Thevas are the budget. The yeah, central channel is only around 350 grand. That's not true. That is for him locally, but in the U S it's much more expensive. Mm. Focal is a French brand. So he may have in euros, Mm -hmm. much easier access to them than we do in the U S. Okay. You got a couple. Yeah. I see them down here. I'm trying to, okay, here we go. Um, how to JC appreciate the $10 super chat. He says, what's your favorite tuning software and microphone looking for a laptop based the jail amps on my boat have built in DSP. I'd love to be able to walk around the boat and tune in different areas. That's pretty cool. That's interesting. How, how does that work when you're in a boat in an open room concept? Basically you don't have boundaries. You don't have a ceiling. Can you still measure the same way? Like with the, you mic one and yeah, a laptop. Absolutely. And then use that to, uses built-in DSP to tweak but in, that. In all honesty, I don't think he's really going to need to do much. I mean, if you're out without any type of boundary and there's nothing for the reflection. The I mean, he's got it inside the boat, but. Maybe. Depends on how the boat's laid out or where the speakers are. If it's like a wakeboard boat and the speakers are up on top of the. 
Oh, I see. Uh, yeah. Scaffolding. Well, then usually, I mean, you're going to have interior speakers as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ones up top are just for the guy back there, wakeboarding or kneeboarding or tubing. REW is fine or Omni mic. It's going to be able to do everything that you want it to do. You don't need anything special. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I've never even thought about, he says, I do have several interior spaces in my boat. It's a 58 foot flybridge. That's a big boat, bro. Mini wow. DSP Omni or you don't need the mini DSP, but Omni mic and or REW would be more mm -hmm. than enough to do what you need to do. Yeah. So Omni mic, they don't sell them right now. Um, one day mini DSP, you can get a mini DSP, you mic one or you mic two. Yeah, but he still needs REW. Yeah, download REW. Um, the Omni mic has their own kind of software. So here's more context from Spillage Village. Okay. I have the reference Premiere Clips Gen 1s. I heard the Focals at a local store. They sounded better than the Clips, to be honest. Could be wrong. Still looking for options. Sounded more mm -hmm. refined. But my Ooh. point, again, is instead of buying the whole system, go up several steps and buy maybe just two speakers instead of the mm -hmm. whole thing. Make mm -hmm. it a worthwhile jump instead of just incrementally. Like, yeah, they may sound incrementally better, but is that worth six thousand dollars of an expense whereas if you put that money into much better subs or much better front left right or and or centers that in my opinion is going to be a much more worthwhile expenditure because you're putting more money into less things mm -hmm. which means a lot of times that you're able to get better performance out of them theoretically i know there's diminishing returns but i think it's just a better approach and obviously you could do what you want but i think it's a better approach to upgrading than just saying yeah you know i'll go from what i have incrementally up a little bit and then buy that and then maybe eventually i'll go up incrementally and buy something else and i just think you're going to get more out of it and here's what i find a lot of people do is they go from these i'm not going to call them entry level but they go from like a something like eclipse system and then they go and they get really good towers or bookshelves. Mm -hmm. And they find that they didn't used to listen to music in two channel before. And then they're like, man, I just lost myself last night for four hours listening to music. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would encourage anybody that's thinking about an upgrade. Think about what you're upgrading and why you're doing it and what you're gaining from it. And make a decision from there instead of just thinking, ah, it's a little bit better. It's, But because you say it's better, it makes the upgrade worthwhile. Make it actually worthwhile. Like huge, huge difference. Make it something that you want to keep for a long time and then add to it to make that system better instead of having to replace the whole thing to mm -hmm. go up a little bit. Yeah. And also just keep in mind, too, you're listening in two different locations, two different rooms two different acoustics, two different probably components. So there's there's a lot of varying factors there. Um, I've heard people buy stuff at a showroom. They get it home and they're disappointed because the room stinks. Like their acoustics is horrible. Um, so, that happens a lot. Yeah. So think about that too. Make sure your room is, and like Ryan was saying, maybe the better option would be to, if you don't have any acoustic treatment, treat the room. You may find a huge Good increase point. in what you have in the performance that they're, you know, they haven't reached their potential yet. So, yeah, Big Street Cinema, appreciate the, I believe that is Krona, uh, 27 Krona. Sub, I'm sorry, kick woofers for LCR down to 40 to 50 hertz. Any benefits? What is a kick woofer? Kick woofer is like for a kick drum or something. Okay. They just call it a kick woofer because it's, targeted at that, suppose, those specific frequencies. So it would okay. go, think of it like your tweeter mid-range woofer on a speaker. You've okay. got your speaker mid-woofer subwoofer mm -hmm. is what they're applying here. Okay. So kind of um, like mid-bass, I guess? Yeah, it's similar to what I'm doing in my room. Mm -hmm. Just for the LCR, though? Down to 40 know. to 50. Big Street, I need more info on this. 
Like what subs are you looking at doing? What are you trying to accomplish? Do you feel like you're missing out on something? Mm -hmm. Up to 150 to 200 hertz? Yeah. I don't understand. Because in your original comment, you say 40 to 50. Right. I'm not sure either. Let us know some more context on that. Von Williams says Bose Acoustamass is the way to go. Mm, I hear they're pretty nice. Once you reach that, it's just end game. There's no going anywhere else from there. Taylor, good to see you, man. He's one of my patrons. Appreciate the follow Super Chat. Hope you guys have a safe and happy Easter Sunday tomorrow. You too, brother. Taylor's a great dude, man. So Big Street gave us more content. 40 to 150, not 40 to 50. Okay. Are you trying to do this for your entire theater or just the LCRs? I think you said LCRs. So I would do it for if you can do it. I mean, I would do it for the whole theater. It's what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I've heard some theaters that do do it, and I think it's amazing. Um, kind of targeting certain certain frequencies with certain mm-hmm. drivers. Mm-hmm. It's definitely a different approach. I don't have any. It is. That. I think if you have the means to do it. I would encourage you to do it. But if you can give us some more context with like the equipment that you're thinking about, what speakers you have right now, what the room's like, that would be hugely helpful. So mostly LCR, but all speakers if good. What subs do you have and what subs are you thinking about to using for kick subs? And if it's easier, just send me an email at ryan at ascendav.net and we can talk about it further. Jeff uh, Back says, Michael, how are you liking the F200s? I just ordered a pair. I'm also coming from RF73, so that's exactly the route that I took. The seven, uh, the F200 just have a great, great, beautiful mid range. I really, um, the first time I ever heard the folded motion horn or mo- folded motion tweeter, I was like, oh, these are so good. But I wasn't willing to give up my seven. Uh, what was that? Yeah, I had the seven threes, and I was reviewing the Martin Logan 60 XTIs. Love the sound of them, but I'm like. Yeah, I just I just had so much um, history with clips. I wasn't willing to let that go. And then when I reviewed the F200s, it brought me back to what I experienced with the 60 XTIs. I'm like, okay, I, I really, really love the mid-range. Um, I think you're going to enjoy them. But definitely let us know once you get those in and uh, let us know what you think. Andrew has a question. Has anyone tried Odyssey 1? So I've heard of this recently. Have y'all? Odyssey one. I looked it up. It's a uh, uh, like, Aka? like a program uh, or something that you run. Yeah. Something like that. I haven't watched the video. Um, but this gentleman basically says like in five minutes, you can plug this in. I think it's kind of like, it's a script maybe somehow. Um, I don't know how it integrates, but I have not tried that yet. What I think it may be doing is taking the inverse of whatever REW is measuring. And then you use that as a, a, house curve and then pump it into the app and then that gives you a more flat frequency response the problem that i have with this Mm -hmm. right is and this is speculation because i don't actually know what this algorithm is doing is you got to be very careful about over boosting because you can create pretty significant issues if you try and boost out of nulls or boost into like um or try and boost out of a deficiency that a speaker may be having in a certain range Um, so just be very careful i mean i i get what they're trying to do and i think it can be beneficial but just be careful you could create other problems that you may have not have had to begin with and maybe odyssey isn't doing certain things because it's seeing a problem and it's Mm -hmm. not boosting out of that problem right or it's not overcompensating and whatever the problem is Mm -hmm. so just be careful is all i'm saying i know nothing about what this product's doing but i've seen things that i think are doing it the same way and just be careful with it so if you're curious about it um check out the channel is called um obsessive compulsive analog is that right audio file i think audio okay i'm zoomed in uh, yeah, it's cutting it off. But anyway, so down here it says optimize your home theater system in under five minutes with just one click platform and installation free revolutionary script that works right in your web browser. 
and redefines what's possible within Odyssey. Just a few clicks, unlocking the full potential of your home cinema audio system. Requires and works with the official multi-EQ editor app. First ever utilization of RoomEQ Wizards API and full automation of Odyssey calibration optimization. So definitely check out his channel. Um, if you search for Odyssey One on YouTube, you'll find that video. But um, definitely interesting, man. Could be awesome. Mm -hmm. Just always be careful so you don't break something or create other issues. Tiki Time says, where do you see home theater technology 10 years from now extinct? Just kidding. Uh, um, man, I mean, I think in 10 years, we'll be seeing probably more of the... Um, Mini LED, I think that's going to be uh, in a lot of, especially living room setups. I don't think they're still, I still don't think they're going to be replacing projectors in a dedicated theater room. Um, but we're going to see a lot of home theaters, because I still consider a, a home theater can be one in a living room. It doesn't have to be a dedicated theater room. I'm not the home theater, I'll just say a home theater snob that says, you're not a proper home theater if you don't have a dedicated room. Most people can't have a dedicated room. And so I don't want people to, to say, well, I don't really have a home theater. Dude, if you got surround sound, you got a home theater. That's the way I look at it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, man, it's, it's hard to predict where this is going. Um, but I think we'll definitely be seeing more of the micro LEDs Mm -hmm. TV technology in 10 years, there's going to be a lot of advancements in that for sure. We're definitely seeing a trend in bigger, more affordable mm -hmm. TVs. Like every day mm -hmm. there's something, yeah. uh, I'm not saying they're all good, but they're, they're yeah. bigger and better. And, and there true. are some really good models and the prices are coming way down. Like yeah. I, it's probably, I don't know if it's, it's probably junk, but I saw something recently. It was like a 98 inch TV for like, 1600 bucks i like, saw i think there was one insane. that was yeah yeah so i think some of them are even a thousand dollars oh my it was god busy Vizio, but i yeah. i mean that's gonna be one of those get what you pay for yeah i, I suspect especially i, who I bought don't Vizio? i don't know didn't walmart or something buy Vizio? yeah yeah vr might be huge christian says definitely i was gonna say i don't I, I don't think VR is going to be like the new home theater. I think it will be the new personal computing device or a, another mm -hmm. computing device. I don't see, I see it as a complement to not a replacement for a TV. So here, here's projector. what I can see VR. VR may appeal to somebody that doesn't have a home theater mm -hmm. that wants the home theater experience, but they're not willing to invest in speakers and subwoofers and, you know, those types of, things. I can see that, but for the, the true enthusiast, absolutely. I don't see us. I'm not switching to a dang headset. There's no way. Even if I have, even if they get it to where the headset utilizes my speakers, I'm still not replacing it. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, yeah. It's, Actually, it's really cool. It's fun to use. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, for the people that it's a, uh, maybe something in the middle, I mean, mm -hmm great on an airplane for sure and <laughs> you know i know uh, a friend of mine he's lives in a 750 square foot apartment he has mm -hmm. no room he doesn't he barely has room for a tv so mm -hmm. uh just extremely space constrained and he he uses that currently and loves it mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but i don't see that being like the, the the future where it just eliminates tvs and projectors altogether. all right i'm not starring any more comments okay. by the way as far as what I think, I don't think speakers are going to change very much. Uh, they may figure out different things for putting speakers above for those direct view LED walls and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they're going to change very much. Um, they haven't really changed a whole lot over the past couple decades. I mean, the philosophies behind them and the, the components maybe have gotten better, but I don't think they've potentially gotten or changed very much displays mm -hmm. are going to continue to get better yeah for sure and let me pull that banner down there we go big street cinema appreciate the 20 dollar 27 i was sorry cronas 
Uh, he says, have you tested a pro level DSP like a DBX Venue 360? And then he has two more comments. He says, or any other pro level DSP instead of the mini DSP. Really expensive in Sweden. So mini DSPs expensive. Are there other alternatives maybe in the pro market that he could use to Absolutely. EQ? I think as long as it accomplishes the same function, mm -hmm. it really shouldn't matter. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the DBX Venu 360. I'm not either, but if it's similar, it should work fine. All right. Oh, we did that one. I forgot to unstart. Tyler says, any budget recommendations for what to use to connect a couple of tower speakers to a, a TV? AVR, the WIM, AMP, etc. I don't have an old AVR floating around. I like... The WIM's been okay. <clears throat> I mean, the Sonos AMP would work. Blue Sound works. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of different options for just doing two-channel. Mm -hmm. um, I know the Blue Sound supports CEC. I think the WIM does, but I don't have any experience with the mm -hmm. I used a blue sound in my living room for a long time um, and it did work great. And the, the mm -hmm. nice thing about it is the app's great. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a, uh, the SVS um, sound base pro. So that's a, a streamer, but has the CC as well. So there's probably a lot of different options that you could look into. The on one that. thing I do like about the Sonos and the blue sound though, is you can connect them to more options in the home for, to create a larger mm -hmm. ecosystem. Yeah. I don't think you can do that with SVS. It's just kind no. of, that's no, it's, it. a, it's a, it's a single unit. Yeah. So if you want a distributed yeah. audio or you wanted to, I don't know, have multiple of these in different places of the house and stream the game to different locations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have that capability with Sonos or blue sound. Um, yeah. They're great. That's what you should look into, though. Gary Pye, he says he pre-ordered the shoe TN1. I shared that announcement. I guess it's been several weeks ago uh, when Dr. Shoe sent me that information. Um, they're coming out with some new subwoofers that will replace uh, one of their existing subwoofers. He says, I own two shoe 12-inch uh, MK5s with mini DSP. Can I blend the new 15 with the new 212s? 14 by 16 rooms, single main listening position. Should I just use the 15 and not the 12s? Are these ported? Uh, the T and one, I believe, is sealed. I have to go back and look at my notes and what I posted. Community. So the T and one. And then what other one does he have? Um, the other one, Rusty, can you read that one? While I look for this. On two HSU 12-inch MK5s. I don't know if the TN1s are on his website yet. They are. Oh, they're? Okay, cool. Yeah, but I don't know. This has got to be it. Is that a 12? Sorry, I'm just reading about it. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of experience so this is with... Ported. A TN1 uses dual 4-inch down-firing ports. I don't know that I would mix those. You could try, but you're going to run into phasing problems. Yeah, Gary says they're ported. Try it. I mean, you have them. Try it. See what happens. Just you may have some anomalies at port tune mm -hmm. for the different port tunes. Yeah, Gary, do you have a do you have a way of measuring the the speakers or your subwoofers? He's got that. Well, I guess he's got the mini DSP, so I'm assuming he does. But yeah man try them you can try it it's different port tunes can create their own level of issues when it okay. comes to a response pedro ortiz says um i should put the subs at 120 hertz on the crossover but at the avr 122 or the lowest that supports a sub like 28 hertz he's talking about the crossover on the sub the dial Mm -hmm. And then he's talking about setting the crossover in the AVR. Okay. So I like that. On the dial, on mm -hmm. the back, it's 120. 
Yeah. Just all the way up. Wide, wide open, highs that'll go. Basically, you're disabling the internal crossover. Yep. And then, and then use the internal or in use your AVR's crossover. THX recommends 80, but in all actuality, if you're really trying to fine tune this, you need to find what allows the sub and the mains to blend the best and have the best transition between the mains going and then transitioning into the sub, however that may be. Um, so usually it's around 80 is what people recommend. Mm -hmm. Getting too much above that, like I saw somebody talking about having 150 hertz as their crossover point. And if you play certain music in there, especially male vocal, mm -hmm. it's going to be coming out of your subs. Yeah. Um, like there's, especially in music, there's some songs um, like The Ghost of Johnny Cash that will absolutely do that. And it coming out of your subs it just doesn't sound right. So does it work for movies potentially? Maybe. But I caution people to use movies as a benchmark because there's so much going on in movies. It's mm -hmm. very difficult for your mind to isolate certain things and for you to identify if there's something weird going on. So if you're trying to look at frequency responses and SPL and thing and how the processor is doing things, um, a good way to do that is two channel in all honesty, because your brain has less to focus on. If you're taking this away from just measurements, um, it is going to provide a much more easily identifiable uh, option for you to see, Oh, this is sounding weird or this sounds great. And it's going to be a lot easier for you to pinpoint than movies. Mm -hmm. Cause we did this with Jonathan. We've talked about this in the past when we were comparing, um, the Trinov optimizer versus Storm's implementation of art. Mm -hmm. And when you put it into movies, it was almost impossible outside of SPL to identify any differences. But when you put it in two channel, night and day, you could very easily identify what one was doing over the other. Because you, focus on it more. you have a much more easy time focusing on those minute details. So just make sure if you're trying to compare this stuff and identify what works best for your, a crossover, really anything in audio, um, take as many variables out of the equation as you can because mm -hmm. it's it's very easy to get yourself overwhelmed and you may not realize that you're overwhelmed. So it's one of those things of, how can I put this? Like when people are adding subjectivity and bias into tests, your mind isn't going to tell you like, there's something wrong. You may not mm -hmm. even realize what's going on. Um, so just try and be as objective about the comparison as possible. Yeah, Pedro, one thing too, I noticed on the second half of that, you said, should you put in the AVR set to 120 or as low as the sub will support, which is like 28 hertz? You no. definitely don't want to do that. You're Even in the internal crossover, you're not going to be able to set it at 28 hertz in the AVR anyway. Um, usually you're... Well, usually I think what's the lowest 60, maybe 40, possibly. Mm -hmm. It depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, if you've got. But I'm saying in the AVR, uh, the the options, you're not going to have. Oh, hertz in it depends AVR. on the AVR. Most like in the storm and turn you can go as low as you want. But yeah, just, in I don't know what the Morants would have. Like I said, I never thought be, about that. I think it's 40. I know you can do 60. Um, I think it'll do down to 40. But, oh, I know it would do down 40 because it used to set my La Scala's to 40. I'm like, these things don't even play down to 70. So <laughs> I don't know what Odyssey was thinking on that. So I always had to crank it up. But, yeah, so you definitely want to take some measurements just to see where that blends well with your your fronts. Megatron's arm cannon. What do you guys think about XTZ subwoofers, especially the triple 12 ones that they have? I think they look bad to the bone. I don't even know um, what those are. And that's an awesome name, by the way. Yeah, it they look really cool. X, Y, Z. Uh, X, T, Z. No, it's X, Y, Z. It's X, T, Z. Uh, I'm so sorry. X, T, Z. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Get with the program, man. Hey, ah. I'm trying to talk and search and share my screen at the same time. And it's not working. So what he's talking about. 1217? I think so. They look no, rad. That is not that's it. it. That's not it. Where is it at? Tell us the model number. Um Spirit Sub 12? Um, There's a sub three by twelve under Ah, that's series. it. Yeah. That's gotta be so, it. Yep. Look at this joker, man. 
This thing looks awesome. That's 312 cool. stack. I think it looks great. Mm -hmm. 2900 bucks. They're over in the UK, I think. Yeah, it's a Euro. Um, I know nothing about them. Yeah, I've heard of them. Some people had asked me if I'd review them. Here's the back. That would be super cool. I love the play damp. Looks, it almost looks pro audio. I like that their measurements seem to be real. That's a weird looking chart. So they'll kind of flat till about 20 Man. hertz. Start dropping off. Guys, XTZ, I applaud you for doing what you just did in showcasing this information. Now, I have mm -hmm. no idea the testing methodology for how you got these numbers, but mm -hmm. just the fact that they're publishing yeah. their bursts yeah. and the frequency response and all Man, of them. I mean, that's slick, awesome. Dude. Look at these things. I think they look sweet. Oh, they even got that's their speaker grills. I think but that yeah, looks I'm, awesome. I'm serious. I think it looks like I said, they look bad to the bone, man. I'm totally now. now would what? you do this over a JTR RS1? Nah, not me personally. Like I said, I and again, <laughs> we're gonna talk about this one day. We're gonna have this fun conversation because it's not always about single digits but for me personally me personally once i've tasted the lower depths i that's what i want out of a subwoofer and the reason i brought up the rs1 is because it's it's similar in price range it is mm -hmm. a little more expensive yeah but um let me look at its what was jeans or james's measurements on this on not on the xgz but on the rs1 that I don't know. Let's look. Big Street says he thinks it's designed in Sweden. Like I said, man, they look really cool. Mm -hmm. Let's see what their towers look like. So, hmm, interesting. The 3X12 is doing 104 dB at 16 hertz. But then I think it's harm that's its harmonic limit. Mm -hmm. So it beats the RS1 by 2 dB at that that range. But that's a lot bigger sub mm -hmm. than the RS1 to get 2 dB. Yeah. Now, 2 dB is significant, right? You're almost having to double the power. Mm -hmm. So I'd take an Irish one though. Okay. He said Vivid Theater says XTZ is using the M and K design. What is that? I've never mean? never reviewed any of the M and K's. What does the M and K design mean? I don't know. Maybe they just the styling, the look. I've only seen the M and K like their square LCRs. I don't really know what their subwoofers look like. But yeah, man, Megatron, I, I think they look pretty cool. They do. B did Zena. If you have a 10 inch and a 12 inch subwoofer, is there a difference or improvement if the wattage and output are the same? What can you expect going from a 10 inch to a 12 inch? Maybe nothing. Depends on all the things, There's a lot of variables. All things that. considered equal. Like, let's say, for instance, same brand, just going from their 10 inch version to their 12 inch version. What would you gain out of that? About two inches. <laughs> Typically, you'll gain a little bit of lower extension. I mean, we're only talking like one or two hertz. Well, um, typically. Um, but in this case, that's dependent on in the, if the driver's better or on the same playing field. I mean, maybe it's not I'm saying go, go with my scenario. Cause we don't have enough information. If it's the same brand that makes a 10 inch, a 12 inch and a 15 inch same series, whatever that is, whether it's Martin Logan clips. Yeah. But typically in those environments, they, all of those bigger subs 
have more power demand as okay. they go up. So, so he's saying if they're the they same. A, yeah, but a lot of times, though, um, well, no, I think you're right. A lot of times they do add additional power. So yeah. it can, uh, my point is it can be better, Yeah, but there's a lot of unknowns yeah, in this situation. For sure. There's a lot of gray. Yeah. So I typically want the 12 to be more power to have a, a bigger amplifier on it than the 10 mm -hmm. does. Yeah. And typically, like Ryan said, if you're buying a, a store bought or I guess a commercial sub one that you're not building, not DIY, they're going to put the amplifier that's needed for that size driver and for those specs. And a lot of times it will incrementally go up. Now, some brands will keep the same plate amp because um, it works for two of them. But usually when you go from a 10 to, say, a 15, they're going to have to increase that the I mean, amplifier on there. There's, my point was there's just a lot of variables in this sure. and that I would not just buy a 10 and a 12 <laughs> and then expect it necessarily to be better. It Probably. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what brand you're talking about, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so if you can give us some more information quickly, maybe we can tack that on. Okay. Just one point of reference. The mm -hmm. 12 inch has a 44% greater area than the 10. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. actually pretty significant. Mm -hmm. It absolutely is. I'm simply saying there's a lot of unknowns in this equation because if it's a crap 12 inch driver, I mean, you're not mm -hmm. gaining anything. You know, there's too many unknowns in this e this equation to provide a good answer. Christian says, which would you choose between the JBL HT, uh, HDI 1200P or the Arndall 172032S? 1200P. In this situation, I would probably do the JBL if they're still on that 50% off HDI sale. 1200P. What and they that? are. It's a sub. So that is a 12 inch. Well, I know it's a sub, but it's a 12 inch thousand watt. Well, I did because of the R and all. I knew that was a sub. Oh. Um, so HDI 1200 P. Let me put this up. And if one of you guys will pull up the R and all. All right. So we're looking at 12 inches, thousand watt amplifier. Let me go to specs, general specs. Okay, so we're getting down. It measures, according to them, down to 28 hertz. So not super, and it's down 6 dB at 28 hertz. So that's not exciting to me. I mean, it is a 12. Yeah. Um. Let's see, what was the other one? The Arndall 1723-2S. Arndall 1723-2S. Boom. Their specs are weird. Why do they do it like this? What do they do? Just how they have them laid out. Let me scroll down. <clears throat> so theirs is only down three, at least according to their specs on their website. Depends on which EQ mode, but you can either do 17 hertz, 24 hertz, or 33 hertz. So they're utilizing two 13.8 inch woofers. So kind of going back to Rusty's, you're going from a 12 inch to dual 13s, and these are both active. I would imagine you're going to get a ton more output. But what's the price difference? How much is the 2S? Scroll up, click buy. So that one is 2,500. And 33, so it's cheaper. Way no, no, no. The HDI is 50% off right now. Okay, okay. I'm just looking on the JBL website. Yeah, if it's 50% off, you could get two of them for the same price of the r and It's actually better than that. It's $1,350 mm. right now. Okay. But you're only gaining 3 dB. I mean... Unless you're stacking them, then it's six. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says, Christian says the only reason why I'm considering the JBL is because it's 1350 right now. 
I mean, 1350 is not insignificant, man. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that's well, but if you're looking at a $3,500 or $2,500 subwoofer, it is what I would try and that's do cool. at this point, Christian, because I know you've been looking for a while, try and find measurements on both, like from a mm -hmm. third party. And see, unless it's clipple data that's being provided um, and that's being done by a third party, like uh, what Ascendo does, which I highly, um, I'm very grateful for because I think that means they're, they're wearing the data on their sleeve and they provide mm -hmm. that um, from a third party. Otherwise, I think you really need to try and get measurements from a third party. Um, it looks like, is this the 1200p? Audioholics has got it. Do they have measurements on it though? They do. Look at that. Pull okay. Up. So let me stop sharing mine. Do, 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 do. Okay. It says Aaron has measurements on the towers. On the towers. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking <clears throat> about towers. I know. I'm just saying. I'm reading, dude. Let's do this. Share. Ignore my bookmarks, but this is. These are the measurements. So, yeah, I mean, it's about 38 hertz. You're down. I mean, 28, maybe that was right. So you're at 90 dB at 25. And Arendelle, if you're doing their website, says they are. Uh, oh, he's done. Audioholics has, has done this one, too. So let's just do the same source here. They're at 92 down to 16. So 92 down to 16 and the JBL is 90 at 25. And then they stop measuring at 25. Yeah. And typically that's because they don't go any lower. They drop off too much, right? Yeah. Or they're harmonic limited. Um, I would... If I were in this position, I mean, if you're not a huge base head and you just want some low end and you're happy with down to 30 hertz, I guess, then uh, do two no of them because you're you're probably yeah. going to get a better frequency response. But yeah, I would that's do hard. Hard I would do me. an Arendelle and then add another one later. Yeah, that's hard if it's for me, only yeah. between those two. But you're in the price point of again the RS one. Why wouldn't you do an RS one for that? Mm. It's 3300 3, bucks. I mean, I like yeah. Arendelle, but the RS1 is more of everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, you have to wait three months. Says, he even mentioned the shoe, and that one's going to go down to what, about 17 hertz? So I think yeah. there's a lot of things that would probably spank that JBL. I mean, I know it's a good price. I think at thirty five or whatever it was, three thousand dollars. I think that's overpriced for that subwoofer, like way overpriced. There's no way on this planet I would pay thirty three hundred dollars for the twelve hundred p. I mean, you can get what so, two Stark fifteens right now for a little bit over a thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how Stark does that. Yeah, but the only reason I bring up the RS one is because in that price point. Mm -hmm. it's difficult to beat, yeah. right? I mean, the other one to consider, this is the other one to consider that just came out is the Ascendo the 16. Mm -hmm. That thing's what awesome. Those run rough, roughly MSRP? Uh, 3300 bucks. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I find this, yeah, we bring this up because if someone's considering spending $3,300 on a subwoofer, that's a significant subwoofer. That's a lot of money. Yeah. So to spend a lot of money on a 12 inch subwoofer that only goes down to 30 Hertz, you would get two of them. Why would it? Yeah, true. But still, why wouldn't I recommend something that would just spank it here like all day long? So yeah, I mean, is the RS one a good fit for everybody? Absolutely not. Not everybody's got a $3,500 budget. Not everybody has room for an 18 inch subwoofer. So I get that. I mean, but yeah, I, I I'll absolutely put a an RS one in the consideration and recommendation if somebody's <laughs> considering spending thirty three hundred bucks. May as well go with the RS two. No, I mean that's significantly more money. Mm -hmm. um, I would do. 
I think the uh, thirty three hundred dollars. The only two that you should really consider are mm -hmm. the RS one, and in my opinion, the Ascendo, the sixteen. I yeah, Stark usually has some great deals, like the Bogo deals on theirs. Yeah. I think there's just a lot of a lot of brands that would do way better than that JBL. You're you're not going to get the performance of the mm -hmm. RS one or the Ascendo, but for a little bit over a thousand dollars to get two fifteens, mm -hmm. I mean. You're going to get two 15s for almost the price of that JBL. Mm -hmm. And AA says, you know, even check out the RSL 12S. So he said, you can get three of those. So I don't know. I, I saw some of the specs on that and I wasn't real excited about the <laughs> RSL. I think it goes back to you buy the biggest, baddest sub that you can get now mm -hmm. and then get another one later. Christian says, yeah, the size and aesthetics of the RS1 kept 100%. it. I don't think it's that big though, especially in comparison to the Arendelle. The Arendelle's not small. It's it's narrow though. All right, so pull up the RS1 just out of curiosity. Let's look at all three of these. <laughs> so, Rusty, if you'll pull up mm -hmm. that JBL. I got um, the. I'll pull up the, the dimensions on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's just see how they compare. I'm going to look at the 1723 2S, what he said. The JTR is 21 by 21 by 18. 21, 21, 18. It's not that big. This one is 53, 42. Oh, I'm sorry. That's centimeters. 2016. I'm going to round 2016, 19. Yeah, it's not. Almost 2016, and 20. The, the JBL is about. 17 inch cube okay you're talking three inches it's not that much bigger yeah now the aesthetics i get the aesthetics because it is like a duratex or a rhino liner paint the on big, the jtr i get that yeah um the ascendo is not the ascendo is you could put that in your living room oh wow bruce said he had one of the starks fail they sent him a new one didn't even want the old one back well, granted, though, sometimes companies, they Shipping. know to ship it back to them, it's, it's a loss. And then all they're going to do is go, okay, this thing isn't working. Now they got to put a tech on it to figure out, okay, is the amplifier, is it the voice coil, what broke down? Then they got to repair it. Then they got to sell it used or refurbished. And I think sometimes it's just easier for them to just go, you know what? Let me just send you one. If it doesn't go low, it's I a no-no. I love it. I'm telling you guys, once you taste single digits, man, it's fun. That's all I'm saying. It's not and only I, fun. It's you can't go back. That's what's hard. But the same thing is true. When I went from my first subwoofer, what what was the the first subwoofer you guys had? Mine was a Velodyne CT100, 10 inch driver, 100 watt amplifier. What was it your was first one? Some type of clip. Okay. I think so mine was Eclipse 2, Eclipse 10 inch, something okay. pretty underwhelming. All right. So think about this. Ryan, what size was yours? Probably 10, 10. 12. All right. So we all started with 10 inch. Where'd you go from, from there? I went from a 10 to a 15. 12. 18. I went from a 15 to. You went straight from the 10 no, to. The... No, actually, I did have a 12 in, in the middle there. I forgot okay. about. Yep. So then I 10, went from 12 15, and then 18. I went from a 15 to dual 15s. What'd you guys go to next? Dual 10s and a 12. I think it was 10 to like 10 and 12. Okay. And then I went from dual 15s to four 15s. What'd y'all go to next? I went to double stacked the rel 212s. Okay. Four 18s. And then I went from four 12s. I'm sorry, four 15s to. Yeah, the dual 18. So four 18s. And then I went to dual 4,000s. And then what are you going to? And then I went to five 4,000s. Okay. And now I'm going to eight 21s, two 32s, and a 50. Okay. Are you saying eight twenty ones? Wow. The reason why I share that is 
in all three of our progressions, never once did we <laughs> taste the better and go backwards. Like I would never, I've yet to find a 12 inch subwoofer that I go, Oh my goodness, this is it for me. You know? And it's not about the money. It's not. It depends about, on the situation though. It, it's not. If it was in your living room. I promise you. Yes. I've got a, I've got a 15 in my living room right now. But my point is, is that you don't have not cool it's not, in your living room. It's, yeah. I'm not saying it's not usable, but I can promise you, I would never go from four eighteens back to no. a 12 inch. That's what I'm saying. Not in your theater. Yeah, there's a, uh, absolutely. You could do an eight inch in my, in my home office right here. That'd be awesome. I don't need a dual eight teams in here. So yeah, there's a time and a place for everything. But what I'm saying is once you have experienced certain things in home theater, it's just really hard to go backwards. Be the same thing as once you experience really deep black levels, going back to something that's really, really gray, that would be really difficult for me. Um, so that's all I'm saying. And I don't think it's, about a certain brand. I don't think it's about everybody needs this. I'm just telling you what I have experienced, what Rusty's experienced, what Ryan has experienced. Once we have experienced certain things, we don't want to go back the other direction. We've been down there and nothing wrong with being there. Um, but it'd be no different than if you had a pro audio subwoofer and it only would reach down to 30 Hertz. That's all you've ever known. 30, 32, 35 and you're like, man, this thing, like, it shakes my house. It's awesome. And then you go to your, your buddy's house, and he's got something that plays down to 20 hertz. And you're like, oh, snap. I've been missing content. Like, there's stuff that happens in Ready Player One or or in uh, Ford versus Ferrari. And when this happens, I felt more of that. I didn't get that at my house because you were missing those frequencies. And then, again, if you go down to single digits, nine, eight, seven, six, five there's a whole other world there too. So that's all I'm saying. It does become diminishing though, because there are fewer and fewer pieces of content that have those, but it is, it is nice to be able to recreate things, but mm -hmm. on yeah. a totally different subject, I think it's important to highlight that what Michael just did illustrates a progression, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. we have had a lot of comments come up yeah. in the past about, and recently yeah. about how we don't talk about, a lot of the like more budget, entry level uh, stuff. Yeah. And we do, sure. but I think it's important for people to remember that we didn't end up at the systems that we have now. I mean, it's all been a journey. It's all a <laughs> long journey. I mean, yes. I've been, Michael's been doing this for a number of years. Yeah. Rusty's I, been I, doing it for a number of years. I, think I started back in Dolby Pro Logic days. So, that's a few years. That's probably 30 years ago, almost I mean, I've been, 25 years ago. Yeah, I've been doing this for not that long, but. Now, my theater room has been about 15 a 15 years. My theater room has been almost an 18 year progress. And that's my dedicated theater room. But I've been in the home theater space. Uh, I used to work at Circuit City. I used to go to Sound Advice every single weekend when I was 16 years old. As soon as I got a car. When I was 15, I was going to Sound Advice. My parents would go to the mall, but I'd have them drop me off at Sound Advice, which was right around the corner. They'd do their shopping. I'd go listen to the speakers. They'd come pick me up. So I've been I've been involved in home theater for a long, long time. But yeah, like Ryan said, it, it it's a progression. And again, I'm not saying that everybody needs to get to a certain spot. If you have a single 12 and five speakers, it's a 5.1 system, and you've got a 70 inch TV or 65 inch TV and you watch it with your family and it, it brings you joy and fulfillment, man, rock it out. If you got a Bose system or a sound bar, I don't care. That's great. I, I will always be an advocate for, and, and really encourage people just to enjoy the hobby regardless. So to say that, you know, we only push higher end, really expensive stuff. We're just at a different point in our journey. Ryan's at a point that I may not ever get to, and I don't really want to. I don't want a 50 inch. But the context for. there is that I do it for a living. Yes. I mean, he's a dealer, you know. But the reality is that we all are on a different journey. You have to figure out what works for you and your budget and what your goals are. All right. Compare, I, I saw Scott Newby in, in the chat earlier. 
Scott's goals are way different than mine. His goal <laughs> is to be able to hit 150 dB in his room. That's insane. Like I don't have a desire to, to do that in my room. I think it's fun to visit his home though. I love it. It's amazing. I think Scott's journey is foundational damage. Yeah. But, but again, what I'm trying to say is that we're all on a different journey. You have to figure out what works for you. Um, but yeah, started with the same sub as Michael. Yeah, dude, you rock. He had the same thing, the CT 100. And that was the jam back then. Velodyne was the subwoofer to have. They had the, the big one that had the marble. Heck yeah. DD 18. That, that joker was like, that was the cream de la creme. Is that the right word? Creme de la creme. Mm -hmm. There you go. Something like that. I didn't even say it right. But yeah, dude, that was that was it back then. But it was so expensive. It was like 3500 bucks or 2500 bucks. Man, that kind of money as a 16-year-old. He's making a whole whopping, what, $4.25 at Ponda Grossa. All right. Good discussion. Brian, appreciate the final of the Super Chat. Will Martin Logan F200s be at M-Wave really struggling versus the Kef R11? Possibly, uh, I think he meant Wharfdale. Thanks. So, Brian, great news. I'm going to pull up this right here. So, this is not accurate on the website because I'm waiting for SVS to send me, and I think earlier, or this coming up week, I believe they're going to try to send that to me. But if you go to Midwest AV Experience, click on Brands. Let me zoom out a little bit. And if you scroll down, you click on SVS. So this is not correct. This is the, um, the items that they brought last year. But I did confirm and I made a post on my channel that SVS is indeed bringing... What am I doing? I'm I don't like, know. I was trying to figure I, out how sorry. you got to SVS too. <laughs> hey, at least I just figured out what I was doing. Click on Martin Logan. Let me click there. So unfortunately, they haven't given us what all they're going to bring. But my understanding is they are going to bring some of the new series. I'm hoping that they'll actually do. I believe, Ryan, you mentioned that Axpona, they're going to have a full Dolby Atmos, or at least a full surround system. I don't know if it's Dolby Atmos, but with the new series. And so that's what I'm pushing for. Um, no, they we'll, brought we'll do that because I'm doing that room with them. So I'm okay. part of that room. So okay. my contact at Martin Logan has said really whatever they want us, we want them to bring, they'll I bring, but yeah, I, I think them. we'll bring that, that set up. Yeah. So it's, it's not locked in stone. So that's why I haven't put that on there. Um, but anytime a brand lets me know that, Hey, look, we are definitely bringing that. I think where I was going with that, when you, when I, Red F200, I was thinking SVS just let me know that they're bringing their new series. So that's where I was going with that. So my bad. And it's even if they have the B100s, the B100 sound signature is very close to the F200s, especially if you have subs and a properly mm -hmm. set crossover. So yeah. something from that new Motion XT line will be there and you'll be able to compare them um, across. So now the Kef yeah, and the Warfendale won't. Yeah. Kef R11. I want to look at those. I'm not familiar with those. Yeah, they're like 3300 each, 3350. They look beautiful, but I haven't heard that series reported. Hmm. Yeah, we won't have Wharfdale there either. Uh, Cam says, I have an RSL 12S sub. I have a 15 inch sealed sub just needs an amp can they be mixed our cell 12 i'm assuming that's ported sealed, right what's the s mean rsl 12 s speed woofer 12 s oh no no that's not the same brand is it yeah rsl speed woofer 12 s i think that's a sealed looking on their website so basically, he's wondering, can I mix a 12 and a 15? Sealed, yes. I believe this. I'm not seeing anything that shows a port on this. Unless that's a vent at the bottom. No, it is ported. It's rear. It's like a rear slot. 
Let me pull this up. Then I would not do that. I mean, you can. So it's just going to be a pain in the butt yeah. to integrate. See, the rear sub fires into here. It comes down this slot and then it exits the rear. That's a rear slotted subwoofer. Yeah, sealed sealed and ported are they're just a lot harder to, to integrate. Alex agreed, even if you guys have a high current power conditioner, would you recommend and recommend plugging in amps and subs at all into them like a firm and elite? <clears throat> I don't plug in my RS2s to my pair sound um, power conditioner, line conditioner, whatever you want to call it. Um and it's not because it can't handle it. It may, it may not. Some people say that they don't, they won't support the juice for that because of the power draw. I don't know if it will. I, the reason why I don't is I've have switched outlets for my subwoofers. So I can reach under, grab two switches and I can turn one or both of them off. Um, that was the reason why I did it. I have, um, my RS2s are not plugged into a, that Furman and I've got that same Furman uh -huh. 20 PFI. Are there um, limits but, on like power that can go through those? It's 20 amps total. Absolutely. Um, but I use, I have the, like my Behringer amps are plugged into those. And okay. they, that's not the limiting factor, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. I think the limiting factor is my breaker as a breaker panel. I thought this is interesting. Bruce says, Ryan, it's funny that Stark on their site actually suggests mixing their sealed and their ported's. Yeah, don't why? do that. Why would they recommend? I mean, that? you can. It's yeah. just if yeah, you're trying to get a if you're trying to get a flat frequency response, it's going to be a pain in the ass. Interesting. I mean, it, that would be terrible. Now, going back to the the Kef comment that came up earlier mm -hmm. with the Martin Logans and stuff. Here's mm -hmm. I got to provide context here. And we talk about measurements a lot on this channel, but mm -hmm. this is something that has come up with the new Martin Logan XT series a lot. And um, frequency chasers don't like the Martin Logans because they don't have a flat frequency response. And Martin Logan knows it. Audioholics actually rated the f100 as one of its products of the year because anybody that listens to that dang speaker loves it and it actually did phenomenally well last year at a blind listening comparison at m wave it finished in the top two right with um tied with svs so don't make that the frequency response be the end all be all. Now, Kef, I really like their objectivity. That's not downplaying them. But my point here is you got to listen to speakers. We all like different things. Make sure you listen to them because even if that Kef measures really well, you may not like it. It's really important. Go listen to them before you buy it. If you can, listen to them in your room before you buy them. Okay. So we already did that one. Caesar says, hey guys, do you think Atmos is becoming more of a marketing badge than a spatial format? We spend our hard earned money on gear and speakers, but the majority of the content out there falls short. Great question, Caesar. Um, the truth is, is that all, all content isn't created equal. All Atmos discs aren't created equal. Um, the reality is there are a lot of times that I've watched a movie and I went, man, that would have been a great, op like a perfect opportunity to utilize those Atmos channels. And for whatever reason, that sound engineer didn't. Sometimes it comes down to budget. Sometimes it comes down to time constraints. Um, so not all Atmos movies are mixed equally, but is it a, a marketing badge? I don't think so. I think when Atmos is done well, it's amazing. I really, really enjoy it. Um, just not every, every movie is going to be an amazing experience in Atmos. What do you I guys think, think when you have like laptops that say they have Dolby Atmos, that's <laughs> just a marketing badge. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. Sound bars, uh, you know, headphones. I know you can kind of, spatial audio does work with headphones, but I feel like that's more, a little more marketing. 
Mm-hmm. But I mean, the movies, good movies, the you know the big blockbusters and the uh, action flicks, they usually have pretty good atmos in my experience. I mm-hmm. I don't know why it's uh I'm not sure what the problem is. Yeah, Ryan says there's more Atmos content than ever, which means there's more misses than ever. That that makes sense. But I'm glad to have the choices. I would agree with that. Something else I would point mm-hmm. out, though, is don't let something not having a great Atmos mix yeah. ruin yeah. a theatrical experience for you. There are many really yeah. good movies out there that don't have amazing Atmos mixes. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean they have bad sound. It just yeah. means they're yeah. not pushing those immersive sound formats so don't just go and be like i'm not going to watch that it doesn't have a great atmos mix man i've heard some amazing Mm -hmm. 5.0 or 5.1 i've heard amazing two channel setups that you'd swear there were it was an atmos mix sure very enveloping so just take things with a grain of salt. Yeah. There's a lot of things as Ryan pointed out that are not good, but I think that's a big reason is there's a lot of content out there and there's going to be more misses. The more we get. Mm-hmm. Chad says, how do I make a small room sound like a big room? That's tough. I, this is something I, I'm starting to learn more about, but um, those I think it's the quadratic diffusers that you put on your ceiling above your head. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't understand all the witchcraft that goes into it, but it, it can create this uh, feeling that the room is bigger than it is. So that may be something to check out. Sure. But I think there's no replacement for an actual big room, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's audio just does better in bigger spaces as long as it's treated well uh, mm-hmm. high ceilings and but you can do things to get yourself back to that feeling as rusty said with diffusion and eq and things like that it can definitely help um I'm trying to think of anything else that you could do treat the room I think you're, I would agree that diffusion might make the room sound slightly bigger. I don't think you're just going to, I don't think you're going to take a 12 by 13 bedroom and make it sound like you're in a dedicated theater room, you know, like a big room. Mm. Uh, I mean, if it's a dedicated theater, it's a dedicated theater, but if you can't get the separation between speaker channels, it's not. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Like you're not going to take a small 12 by 13 room and make it seem like a 25 by 40 room. It's going to be difficult. Diminishing returns, but no, you can't. There's no substitute for size. Uh, Make sure that one the same one. Yeah, that was the same one. Blue metal. Youth man, how can I add height speakers without an attic and no holes? Currently use Atmos upfiring speakers and does not sound very good. Yeah, you're probably correct. A lot of times the the upfiring Atmos they don't do as well. There's some specific situations that it can sound good and and real and realistic, but a lot of times they they come up short. But no holes, you can't. There's no well, way. Um, well, I mean, so this isn't. I don't r- like it, but you can run your speaker cables. Mm -hmm. outside the walls yeah you can but he says no holes so i took that as meaning you can't drill into the ceiling well you mount the speakers yeah but to mount the speakers he said no holes i've seen somebody do something he's talking about all right give us some clarification blue if you're still in the chat i thought he meant like no holes like and in ceilings. I mean if he means that just do an on wall and then run Mm -hmm. as rusty said run the speaker wire behind a cable hide and you'd be good to go. Yeah. I mean, you definitely, you're not going to put blue tack on the wall and stick them there. I've seen some people do get creative with like, um, like pipe, like kind of like, but kind of like pipe and drape, but using stands and mounting the speakers to pipe. Okay. So if they're in an apartment yeah. and they're not allowed to drill in, mm. um, not the most aesthetically pleasing, but if you, if you really want to make it happen, you can do that. That'd be creative. 
but I feel like there's nothing even in an apartment that says you can't drill into the ceiling. People mount things on the walls all the time. Just buy some of that uh, hole then, patch filler on your way out. Fill the holes. Yeah. Repaint. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. Now, if you can't put any holes in the wall or ceiling, then like you said, Rusty, you may have to get kind of creative. Michael, do you plan on upgrading your AV receiver anytime soon? What are you considering? Not necessarily. I've thoroughly enjoyed um, the past four Morants. So I had an SR8012. Then I went to the SR8015 AVRs. Then I went to separates SR, I'm sorry, AV7705. And now the 7706. Super stable. Um, that's the biggest thing. So I'm reviewing the AVM70 now from Anthem. And definitely having not major bugs. Definitely it's not like buggy, but we ran into a couple little hiccups with it. Um, mostly seems like ha HDMI handshake issues. Um, one time I didn't have any, uh, I think it was, I had to go back and look at my notes because I wrote it down because I want to remember it for the review. I think there was no audio. It was on the Apple TV. If I switched it to, I'm sorry. Anyway, I need to look back at my notes. One source at work, but then I switched to another source. Maybe it was Kaleidoscape. But then when I went back to Kaleidoscape, there was no audio. I'm like, what the heck? So then I had to power it down, power it back up. And it went, oh, no oh. audio. That's an interesting one. Yeah. So it was just kind of goofy like that. We didn't get any test tones initially from when we were running. We're like, okay, we're supposed to be hearing out of speakers, but we're not. I had to get real close to the speaker and then I could faintly hear the test tone. Again, powered it down, turned it back on, worked fine. So hmm. just some little hiccups like that. Um, and it's running the current version, so it's not a firmware issue. Um, so the stability of the Marantz, absolutely love it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not like chasing anything. If something better comes along and I'm like, man, this is kind of like what Ryan's saying. Like if this is super significant, then yeah, I'd, I'd be absolutely inclined to upgrading. But if it's like, if I'm doing a lateral move, certain features are better, but this is not as good, then I'm not as apt to apt. Yeah. Apt mm. to to upgrade. Uh Daniel, considering a Parasound Halo A52. It's a beast of an amplifier. To power my SVS 7.2.4 system. Currently my Yamaha Avantage RX. A8A is powering all 11 speakers. Recommendations. Um, SVS isn't like super efficient and you're running 11 speakers off an AVR. Um, I definitely like having an a, or a, a dedicated amplifier. It's, in my opinion though, a lot of times adding an amplifier in my setup has always been kind of what Ryan was talking about earlier. It was really, it wasn't night and day, that's for sure. But I've always had really efficient speakers too. The less efficient your speakers are, I think the more difference it's going to make. But again, you got to double the amplifier power just to get three decibels in gain and volume. Um, so it may not be massive difference from you. Um, it depends on the power supply in the A8A. I don't, I'm not familiar with that. I had an older Yamaha RXV 1800. I was running five speakers as a bed layer, and they were, these were very efficient speakers. Five speakers, like a 5.2 setup. And I bought a pair of bookshelf speakers for surround back, added those, and it was like kind of like the life was sucked out of it. And I went, what in the world? Even turning up the volume to give it more juice, still didn't have the same like wow factor. Um, so I think part of it's going to be, you know, what is the capability of that? So I would encourage you maybe to look at some reviews to see if anybody's done any measurements on the A8A to see what it's actually measuring with, you know, more than five channels driven. Most places aren't going to give you, and I don't, I don't know exactly how that works out, but I don't think anybody's going to tell you how much 11 speakers driven, what the rating is. Usually it's five, maybe Usually seven. It's, yeah. On on but this particular model, it's 150 ohms, two channel driven. 
But what I'm saying is there are pe- there are third party people that oh, will measure sure. these. That's what I'm saying. You know, see if there's somebody that has actually measured it and reviewed it, um, like Audioholics or. A but if meter. he doesn't listen very loudly, he's not going to gain anything. Yeah. So there's definitely some things to consider. Um, but the A52, I reviewed it. It's it, that Joker's a beast. It's a horse. It is. It's a great amp. It'll survive the mm-hmm. next world war. I mean, they're built like Parasound builds their stuff, built like tanks. Yeah. The the thing you got to remember here is if you're comparing about 50 watts. Yeah. So yeah, that, I could get behind that. 50 yeah. to 70 watts. Yeah. But it, are you listening really loudly? How far away is your main listening position from the LCRs or from any of your speakers? The thing you got to remember here, and this is something that a lot of people don't do, is when you use like your LCR, whatever channels you're going to put on that amplifier, coming out of the pre-outs into the amp and then to the speakers, they'll make that change and they'll be like, oh man, this is a night and day difference, but they didn't SPL match them. Mm. And we perceive an SPL increase as an increase in clarity. So mm-hmm. you've now just colored your test, right? You have to SPL match. And I can almost guarantee if you don't SPL match, you're going to have a subjective result. If you like it loud and you're 10 feet away by the amp. You're not one thing, Daniel, you're not going to have to worry about like running out of headroom. That uh, amp is not, I don't think so. I don't think it puts out tons of power. I think it's a it's couple just, hundred watts per channel. Yeah, but it's the I mean, A52, 180 at 8 ohm, 255 more at than 4 ohm. For most speakers. What speakers are you running, Daniel? Did he say? SVS. Okay. And like I said, they're not inefficient, but they're not super efficient, if it's that makes my sense. Wife that. Uh, What's that? It just, he's typing uh, in chat. So oh, I, I would say if you like it loud and you're that far away and you've got the disposable income to make that parasound happen by the parasound. The parasound is an amplifier that if you're comfortable with that amount of output for power, it's an end game amp. There's it. Parasound makes phenomenal stuff. Mm -hmm. They make great amplifiers. I mean, I sell them for a reason. They, they do great things. Now it's class a B. I think Mm -hmm. they launched a class D but the A52 is not a class D. So it's not hugely efficient. They weigh a ton, but Mm -hmm. they're built like tanks. You want to get something that'll last forever? When you go look at used sites, there's pair of sounds that are, I don't even know how old. And they just keep trucking. And they do great. He's got the ultra bookshelves. He's got six of those. So Ryan, what would you think about, like, you know, you can get a, a monolith five or seven channel amp um same or more power for less Mm -hmm. money or a buckeye class Mm d same or more power for less money so why would you want to go parasound over one of those i think parasounds i don't think one is better than the other i think it becomes it comes down to brand reputation and what you like and parasound has a name that instills quality in a lot of people because mm-hmm. they've been in the industry forever. So I don't think you'd go wrong with any of the brands that you mentioned. I think they'd all mm-hmm. be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, the Buckeyes are going to be much more efficient. And I think the Buckeyes are going to measure better. Will you hear that? No, but it just comes down to what you want. People want different things. That's why there's so many different brands. I feel like Amps is one of those places where you can save a lot of money and not really give anything up. Mm-hmm. potentially but you do give things up i mean l- let's look at the buckeyes right aesthetically the buckeyes aren't fantastic true but they're cheaper it's compromise so <laughs> paris sound is the poor man <laughs> i love it uh i i don't know i think paris but sound is tell, tell your wife that that's another plus maybe i could be looking at, at macintosh i mean come on you need to start what there and work your way down these are budget friendly. That's what y'all to tell her. Now you could say a Macintosh mm-hmm. is a poor man's Augustino. Yeah, Ryan maybe says maybe higher, that. slightly, slightly higher resale value on the Parasounds. That is a really good point, Ryan. <coughs> that for resale value, the Parasounds will command more because of the name. 
Yeah, like I paid seven hundred. Yeah, I paid seven hundred fifty bucks for a ten year old Parasound amplifier, two twenty by five. Yep. So if you think you may may ever flip it, mm -hmm. Parasound's going to hold its value better. Absolutely, it's great. Anthem point. makes good amps. Yeah, they're going to be a little pricey, but even but Parasound is too. All right, let's see if we can run through these last few here. Jeremiah says I'm looking to use either two fourteen inch or two sixteen inch subs from the new reference premier clips line in the sealed room. 12 foot by 21 foot by eight foot ceilings. Would the 14 be enough or should I go with the 16? Man, I'd, I recommend going with the 16. And remember the illustration, if you were here earlier, once you go bigger, there's more pressure. Um, but the 14, I mean, I've seen great people say that the 14 has been a great sub. Um, it's probably their best seller, but the 16 performed very well at M-Wave last year. They're decent Lots subs. Like it. It's really mm -hmm. weird to say that about Klipsch, but they're mm -hmm. they're not awful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, I mean, to me, if I had a chance to to go from technically a well, 14 inch versus a 16 inch sub, I'd go with the bigger sub. Nobody ever complained about a sub for as long as it's good being too big. Mm -hmm. I mean, aesthetically, I guess you could complain, but yep. You know, uh, da, da, da. man, this is the same. Yeah, he hit that about six times. He did. <laughs> he wanted to make sure we answered. needed that answer. We tried to, like I said, we we do our best to star most of the questions and, and go through them in the order that they're, they're received, unless it's the super chat. Uh, Philippe Feta says, Why is that when I'm doing a subwoofer sweep, I can hear that certain frequencies are more loud on one sub than another? Frequency response is flat at the main listening position and subwoofers are level matched. Are you sitting in the main listening position? Yeah. Because it sounds like it's just room interaction, but if it's flat mm -hmm. at that position, I'm going, well, then you've compensated for it. I think there's something. So he's hearing on one. Here. Let's just. Let's just say he's got two subwoofers. So he's saying when he oh, he's just speed, localizing them. So he's hearing one more than the other, but he's still getting a flat frequency response when both of them are played at the same time. Yeah. So it's room interaction. A, could it even be a higher like what crossover? Well, it's there. It could be many things, I guess, is what I should say. Was this done by? Room EQ, did you EQ these? How was this done? I mean, there's a ton of variables that could play into this, but that's not unheard of mm -hmm. at all. You could have a flat frequency response, and then you could have one of your subs be like way hot at certain mm -hmm. frequencies, and it could measure flat at the main listening position. But if you sit in the seat that's closer to that sub, you may be getting hammered by that frequency. So it just, it depends. He says he one said, subwoofer has a dip and the second not. So it's not summed frequency response. There's a lot of things that can happen here, right? It's not, you local, are you going up and listening to these subs? I think he said from his main listening position. I don't remember him. He measured at the oh, main oh, that's position, right. but he doesn't yeah. say how he's interpreting that one is louder than the other. I mean, flip, there's a lot of variables in this. I mean, it's tough to give an answer without being in the room, hearing it your, myself, mm -hmm. but there's the subs are not typically going to measure the same if you measure them all individually. So one could have a huge null, one could have a boost there could be all different kinds of room modes that are interacting there or if it's room eq i mean the eq could be totally different for those different subs so many different things can be causing this and what you're running into is not uncommon christian says what do you guys think of the mini dsp flex ht if you're using powered speakers and a streaming apps can i get away with this over a full-blown receiver yes if you wanted to, it's is only that eight power panels. Though? No, it's just a pre. So how is you it would have to run? You would have to run an amp. It would replace a pre. 
Yeah. But he's talking but, about so, and pump. it's six hundred dollars. So isn't that what was the Denon like thirty five hundred or thirty eight hundred that keeps on a ridiculously good sale? Yeah, thirty eight. Thirty eight hundred is usually pretty affordable. What would the mini DSP do that that doesn't? I'm trying to remember. Manual I EQ. About, I think he's just talking about cost, though. The mini DSP is going to give you much more granular PEQ than the denim yeah. will. Flex HT is 600 bucks. But you have to buy an amp separate. You do. Mm -hmm. So you got to add that into the cost. There were some denim that I can't remember what model number it was. I don't think it's a 3800, but it keeps going on sale for like. It's the 3800. It is? Yeah. Okay. For like a thousand or eleven $1 hundred dollars. Like Adorama or something. Yes, it's the thirty eight hundred. Oh, and so he, it's going on sale for how much? Oh, Bruce says he says with powered speakers. Then he's that. fine. Oh, oops. I wasn't thinking about that. My bad. Now, what about processing though? So how does that work? Is it? I don't know what got, Codex it supports. Because it's got eight. I'm looking at it. Okay, so eight it channels. is. Yeah, it's got multi-channel direct live. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it would work. It's just... I just haven't used it, so... Yeah, he said his LCR and surrounds are powered, so I don't need a separate amp. Yeah, it'd be great. I'd right. like the PEQ you would gain from it. So he's just looking at, man, do I spend 600 bucks or do I spend 1200 bucks on an AVR? If that's how many speakers you had, like if you had seven speakers, mm -hmm. and then you were splitting out the subs out of the last one... I'd probably do the PE, the mm -hmm. mini DSP because I want the PEQ capability. You won't okay. get that on the Denon. Last couple questions. Uh, Ted K says, where to put side surrounds? Ear height? Two foot above? The, well, so here, or slightly so, above. Mm -hmm. So here, again, this is where context and additional information I think would be desired. Um, if you've got multiple rows of seating, if you put your bed layer at the ear level of your front uh, seats, it's really going to be kind of wacky for the people in the rear because they're going to be, what, another at least 12 inches, 14 inches higher. Um, so to me, those are going to be entirely too low. Yeah. Um, Ideally, if you had one, one seat, though, ear level. <clears throat> so here's another challenge. And, and again, this is my personal opinion. If. But you're adding a bunch of other variables here. And I'm saying if you had I'm one seat. Oh, one seat. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't hear that part. If you're, I'm thinking like if you have one row, like a couch or three seats, again, you're going to have people's heads in the way. Lightly above. So I would rather put them up a little bit. Um, same thing if your seat backs are really high. So there are definitely some variables there, Ted, but um, two feet might be too much. I mean, I think Pretty you, could high. Away, you could probably get away with a foot above and still be good. Um, but yeah, so that that's always more difficult when you got multiple multiple rows of seating and you're only using one set of side surrounds. And then the last question of the night, Benji says, in the market for a new processor between a Marantz and with Dirac versus an Anthem with ARC, uh, Arch Genesis, I'm in analysis paralysis. Been there, brother. I think we all have. Any recommendations to pair with Kef speakers and dual subs? The age-old question. <clears throat> I am going to say Marantz. Because I feel like it's a more stable platform. I think the Room EQ, you're really not going to be able to tell. You're going to get more granular control out of Dirac, but, and that can solve some problems. But if you're just letting it do its thing, I don't know that you're going to be able to tell. Mm -hmm. But I like Marantz's stability. When we I, did the EQ comparison, uh, I couldn't tell a difference between blind. I couldn't tell a difference between Dirac and Arc. They both sounded really good. Yeah. So. Yep. Benji, if you want more info on that or have a conversation, shoot me a text yeah. or an email and I'll, we can have a chat about it. And going back to the mini DSP, 
Yeah. It does not support Dolby or DTS decoding. So good catch on uh, whoever that was. So it has Big Dirac. So is that more for... Dirac is just frequency response. Just room correction. And, e cor and equalization. So does it do any surround sound processing at all? Or is it, it just for trying to... Did. You can do the TV's eARC and then have mm -hmm. the TV decode it and then send PCM back to it. But you can't okay. have it do it natively. Okay. That makes sense. So it does support ARC and eARC and you can have a device decode and then send PCM back to this and then it'll output mm -hmm. it and do EQ. Yeah, so honestly, Benji, you're going to get a ton of different answers on this. And typically we recommend what we own or what we've used. Um, Anthem yeah. guys are going to say, go with Anthem. I mean, I've go used them Moran. all. You know, a lot of guys own Morantz are going to be like, go with Morantz. If you like Dirac, you're going to like Dirac. If you like Arc, you're going to like Arc. Um, Ever since Morantz put four sub outs on their medium to high end stuff, I mean, that's mm -hmm. tough to beat, man. Four independent sub outs. Well, Anthem does that too on what is it? But I think it's the AVM 90. 90. Uh, so they don't <clears> do it on the 70. I thought they had it on the 70. Do they? I'm only using two. So uh, Anthem. AVM 70. Let's see if it does have. Nope. 15.2. Hmm. And that's a processor yeah. only, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's it. Man, you have to go 90 to get it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's a big jump in, in price. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a real big jump. Yep. What does the 90 give you? 15.4? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, four independent. Mm -hmm. I'd do Morantz or Denon. Like I said earlier in the show, I mean, the Morantz that I've owned, the four of them, two AVRs and two processors, they've just been rock solid, stable. And that means a lot to me. Like, I want to go into my theater room or have my kids go into my theater room, hit one button on the remote, you know, on the, the Harmony, everything powers up, and they can just start watching. They never have to worry about, you know, am I going to have any glitches? Am I going to have to figure something out? Um, and not other, I've kind of heard some people that have Arkham, you know, kind of the same thing. They've had some little quirks and bugs with them. So that's, that's just one of the biggest things. I think you'll see the difference between a Marantz and an Anthem is just the stability of the, the Marantz. With Dirac, I think that's going to give you a lot of flexibility on room correction. If you're, a tinker and you like to get in under the hood and really dial it in, you're going to have a lot of flexibility with that. Um, not to say that Anthem's not a great product. There's a lot of guys that own Anthem and they love it and wouldn't change it. They look yeah. gorgeous. I love the app on it. I used to hate apps, but now there's something about, I don't know, just about the user interface. It's slick, man. Yeah. And... Well, go ahead. On the flip side of that equation, though, mm -hmm. with the AVM70, if you need XLR and want balanced connections or need the higher, I don't know what their voltage output is. Where's the specs? What is their voltage on output? On the AVM70? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, the web UI is really good. Where yeah. are you? Let's see. Do you tell me what your output is on these things? No. Yeah, probably not. They do not. But theoretically... I don't know what their voltage output is, but usually it's higher on XLR. So if you need that um, or oh, want that, it can be yeah. beneficial and they're balanced so you can defeat some interference. Yeah, but, but wouldn't he get that with the Marantz too? Not from a 3800. No, he didn't say 3800. He didn't he say said, processor at all though. I'm in the market for a new processor. Oh, he did. Then yeah, he would. Marantz or Anthem. Then yes. Sorry. I missed that part. Okay. I was looking at using the 3800 with. Uh, okay. Like external amplifier. It's pre outs. Gotcha. Anthems are hot on the output. That's they're probably using a increased voltage over RCA, which is typical. Arkham is difficult to set up. Yeah. 
Hopefully that gave you some insight. Well, cool, man. We're at the two hour 24 mark again. Just want to give a big thanks to Ascend AV for sponsoring the podcast. So if you guys need anything, hit Ryan up. You can visit his website, ascendav.net. Speakers, subwoofers, and you pretty much you sell it all. I try to. Sometimes he'll even fly out to your house. Hey, if you're willing to pay him, he'll fly out to your house. No, I do it. travel. It's it's Set more it about if you need a full system or theater, I try not to rely on others to do installs. And I when I say try, I mean I don't. I do everything myself. So yeah. nationwide, but if you need something, even if it's just ask a question, I'm happy to help. Yeah. Good I'm just glad that. that I have, we finally figured out a way to give back to this. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm grateful. Well, cool guys. Y'all have asked some amazing questions. We probably did 40 questions tonight in the past two and a half hours. So that was a lot. Grateful for you guys. Hope you have an incredible Easter. If you celebrate Easter tomorrow with your family, that's why we did it tonight instead of tomorrow. So we'll be back on our normal schedule next week. So hope you guys have an incredible week. And we'll catch you in the next one.